Superior Court for the Judicial District of Stanford at Stanford and National Criminal Business is now open and in session. The Honorable Judge Randolph presiding. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Please be seated. When we concluded the session yesterday, the court had been informed that there had been a possible disclosure of an evaluation report that the court ordered sealed yesterday. The court indicated that the state, who had indicated to the court that a note was passed to the state, would investigate to find out from whom the note came, how that person would know whether there was a violation of the court order to seal, and any other information that the court would, or rather the state could develop concerning the allegation yesterday. So the court will hear from the state. Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court. Uh, Judge, uh, we were able to conduct a, an investigation in the evening hours last night, and we were able to uh, speak with uh, the witness who passed the note, Ms. Carrie Luff. She provided a written statement to our office late last night. Um, additionally, we were able to pull um, footage from YouTube, which corroborated Ms. Luff's uh, statement. There were additional witnesses to what occurred as well um, from the state's attorney's office. I'll just indicate, Your Honor, that our investigation has revealed the following, that the defendant absolutely had the sealed report on her computer screen, that it was being displayed in violation of a court order, and that the defendant's mother attempted to prevent her from being discovered as having violated that order by tapping her on the shoulder and bringing it to her, our, her attention that we were about to address it with the court. And so that's what our investigation has revealed. Now, we were prepared to go forward this morning with the contempt hearing, if that was the court's pleasure. The court has indicated to us that it doesn't wish to take it up at this time due, due to the fact that we do have a jury that is waiting and we are trying to get to a resolution of this case. But it is amazing that nearly five years after Jennifer Dulos' death, that this defendant still will not let her rest in peace. Judge, we're asking that the defendant's mother be ejected from the remainder of the proceedings. This is not the first time that we have brought an issue concerning the defendant's mother to the court's attention. Now, the first time we brought it up, we did it at sidebar. We indicated that we received information that the defendant's mother was mouthing to the jury. We indicated that we didn't wish to make a spectacle of it. Counsel assured us that they would speak with the mother. And I know that the court recalls that conversation. And now this is the second incident in which the defendant's mother has injected herself into the proceedings in a very inappropriate way. And I'll just indicate, you know, I'm expecting some argument. Well, the Farber family blows kisses at people and makes hearts at people, things of this nature. First I'm hearing of it this morning. And we've spoken with them in the interim. But this is now a second strike for the defendant's mother. And I'm asking that the court eject her from the remainder of the proceedings. Her conduct is inappropriate. And the fact that she tried to prevent the defendant from getting caught by tapping her on the shoulder, and then the YouTube clip you'll see, the defendant immediately takes action with respect to her computer. So I don't make this request lightly, Judge. I have to say I've been practicing law for nearly 15 years, and this is the first time that I think I've ever made such a request. But this is beyond the pale, and I'm asking that the court do something about it pending the contempt proceeding. 
Your Honor, Attorney McGinnis's comments reveal just how highly charged um, this trial has been and how um, much emotion there's been in the courtroom. We have taken steps to um, avoid and ignore any negative interaction and to try to focus on the evidence in this case and on ensuring that the evidence goes before the jury without any interruption. As Your Honor knows, we've talked repeatedly to the media to ensure that they were not able to pick up anything on our computer screens, anything that was on our table of evidentiary value. I, I have confirmed with them that, in fact, they, they have taken those steps. They've complied repeatedly and ensured that they've been in compliance with the court's orders. Uh, as far as if we are addressing today, Mr. Konis's mother being in court, we did talk to her about the allegations last time. We did not know that she was making any inappropriate movements, gestures, signals in any way. And we have no evidence other than a statement from uh, Jennifer Farber Doulos's friends and family that that in fact occurred. I, I do not understand why the state is suggesting that any interaction that Mr. Conus's mother had with her about putting something on her screen, taking something off of her screen, has to do with avoiding getting caught for something. That, that, that's just an inference that doesn't seem to be based on anything that I've heard so far. I know Your Honor is taking up those allegations at another time. However, what I will address right now is the fact that there have been other interruptions and disruptions and um, comments that have been made in the courtroom galley that we ignored and will continue to ignore. We don't feel the need to put anything on the record. We've addressed it with your honor and chambers. I, I don't know why that needed to be put on the record now, but rest assured, your honor, we've taken steps to speak to Michelle Traconis's family, to speak to Michelle and ensure that there are no further disruptions. Her computer is not here today because I, I'm not going to be focusing on what somebody has or doesn't have on their computer. We need to listen to the evidence and ensure that what's supposed to come in before the jury comes in and what's supposed to stay out stays out. Thank you. This court makes every effort to conduct proceedings in a fair and efficient and dignified manner. This court makes every effort to show counsel and the defendant respect. What the court is not going to countenance are competing pep rallies like you have in high school. The defendant supporters and the state supporters. This is not high school. The court is not going to become a hallway monitor. So if there are efforts to communicate with a jury or a witness, you will be removed. No hearing, just removed. There will be no computer use other than by counsel in the courtroom. There will be no communication with the gallery at any time. There will be no attempts to show your approval or disapproval of a witness's testimony. Or you will be removed. The court is not going to take up a formal contempt hearing 
today. The court will schedule a contempt hearing at the earliest after the defense rests. That's at the earliest. Are we ready to proceed? Yes, Judge, we have uh, one witness and then um, we have Detective Kimball and we're gonna be playing the third interview in its entirety. <coughs> I believe it's three hours and 50 minutes. I gave another copy to the defense last night. Um, so I know the court is going to be taking additional breaks, but I just want to let the court know what we have on schedule for today. Thank you. We can bring the jury out, please. <clears throat> Council stipulate, please. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, let's take all Scott Grin, Grin Rob to the stand, please. You could please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm, as the case may be, that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, shall help you God or upon penalty of perjury? Yes, Please state your name and spell it for the record. Scott Grinrod, S-C-O-T-T, last name Grinrod, G-R-I-N-D, Yes, Sir, you may be seated. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. Good. How are you? Uh, by whom are you employed, sir? m and Bank. Okay. Now, did that used to be People's Bank? Yes, it was People's Bank until 2022 when they merged. How long have you worked for, for um, well, did you work for People's Bank as well as M&T? Yeah, I was hired by People's in 2015, May. And uh, with the merger to M&T Bank, uh, did you retain your employment with that company? Yes, I did. What is your role with the company? I'm a security representative currently. Okay, what are some of your duties and responsibilities? Uh, currently, as a security representative, I oversee the branches, uh, but with people, we did all the video, all the alarm codes, all the card access program. We ran all of that out of the command center. Where is command center? Bridgeport, Connecticut. Okay. Well, how many people do you work with um, with respect to all the videos from the branches? There was only three of us in the command center. We work 24-7. Ed, were you working in that role in 2019? Yes, I was. Was that also at the command center? Yes, in Bridgeport. Did that, uh, I guess, command center encompass a bank branch in Avon, Connecticut? Yes, it did. Uh, would that be People's Bank off of uh, West Main Street? Yes, it was. Is there a video surveillance uh, on that ATM at what was People's Bank on West Main Street? Yes, there was. And are you familiar with that area, sir? Yes. Okay. And are you familiar with the uh, video surveillance at that ATM? Yes, I am. In what way? Uh, just viewing it as needed, during different transactions or as now, asked. Now, in 2019, sir, was a request made to download a video from that bank branch? Yes, sir, was. For May 29th, 2019? Yes. And were you present when that download happened? occurred yes I was and did you view the video at that time yes I did okay. uh, if I may just have one moment yes your honor state's offering 147 I don't believe there's an objection I'd move it in at this time that's right what is the number please 147 147 admitted as false thank you 
I'm going to have you take a look at either the screen in front of you or right behind you. I'm going to open a file marked People's Bank. Sir, do you recognize what's depicted on the screen? Yes, that's Avon's branch. And that would be the camera coming up to the ATM. And the date and time, sir? It was Wednesday, May 29th at 2.31 p.m. And the player that it's being played on, is that the player that was used in 2019? Yes, the visual intelligence. <laughs> is the time correct, sir? Yes, it is. Is there a way, um, well, let me ask you this. At the command center, did you have access to all the uh, video surveillance um, in Connecticut for the banks? Yeah, we had access to all Connecticut, all New England, all the branches that people owned. Was the time synced for all of the videos? Yes, what it is, a DVR goes into the server inside the branch. That branch is connected to the People's Bank United server in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And that's how you get your date and time. I'm going to have you take a look at the video, please. Thank sure. you. Just going to pause it there, sir. Uh, is that the view from the ATM machine at the bank? Yes, it is. Okay. And this vehicle, is this a drive-up ATM? Yes, it is. Okay. And inside the view, the individual reaching out, is he, uh, is that, is he reaching towards an ATM machine or what is he reaching towards? Yeah, he's reaching directly at the ATM machine. And the passenger side where the female is located, is there any, any bank incident or bank camera that focuses on that side of the vehicle? No, there's not. Okay. If I can, I'll just finish playing the video. Okay. Thank you very much. I have nothing further, Your Honor. I just have a couple of questions, and may I just ask you to leave the... You want to pick this, up? Yeah, just if you could put up that same stop portion. I just have a couple of questions. Sure. Good, mor good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Um, so we can just... All right, that'll be a good place to stop it. Um, this car is reflecting something that is where the cam correct correct and that's the that's the screen for the uh, ATM right correct so when you see the driver there reaching out he's actually it's a push screen correct like touch screen right and then it looks like in the reflection he put his ATM card into the uh, machine that we're sort of <coughs> seeing in a reflection of the side of the car correct in correct. reverse 
Correct. Okay. In order to find this particular clip, did you have to look for a particular client account? No, we were given a date and a time period, obviously, when the transaction occurred, and that's what we burned. Oh, and did you also, however, look into or try to obtain the account information so what the transaction was? We don't have access to accounts. Oh, okay. So what you did was the um, was Which, just get the camera. Exactly. And you then downloaded that and then <clears throat> provided it, correct? Correct. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Is there a redirect? No, sir. Thank you. So you may step down. Thank you, sir. If I may just return this to the clerk, Your Honor. Judge, just before I call my next witness, I wanted to put something on the record, and I did bring this to the court's attention yesterday. Uh, just for the jury's benefit, when I was examining Kristen Maydell uh, back on February 5th, I asked her the following question. This is from page 16 of that transcript. But I want you to assume the following facts are true. I want you to assume that the defendant in her third interview with the police indicated to them that she had held a bag open for Mr. Julius as he deposited something in the bag. Is it possible that her DNA could have, could have gotten on the bag as she was holding it? Answer, yes, that's possible. If you... We know that if you come in contact with something, it is possible for you to leave your own DNA behind on an item. Judge, I misspoke when I gave that particular hypothetical about what the defendant said in her third interview, and I just wanted to apologize to the court. It was uh, inadvertent, but obviously because I misspoke, that hypothetical should be stricken and the jury should be instructed to disregard it. They're going to hear exactly what was said in a moment. So, Thank you. What the court intends to do is in its instructions to the jury, remind the jury of uh, that part of the evidence that the state wishes to be stricken. Yes, sir. I just wanted to put it on the record. Thank you. Um, the state calls uh, Detective John Kimball. Still on the road, Detective Kimball, so you may be safe. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, may I just have some exhibits marked for you? Morning, Attorney. Welcome yes. back. Thank you. Detective, where we had left off, you indicated that the defendant had participated in a third interview with the state police. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Did the Connecticut State Police continue to investigate the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos during the summer of 2019? Yes, we did. And did the Connecticut State Police learn additional information as the summer progressed? Yes, we did. 
were arrangements made for the defendant and her attorney, Andrew Bowman, to come into Troop G for a third interview with the police? Yes. Who was present for this third interview? Uh, it was myself, uh, Detective Corey Clabby, the defendant, and her attorney, Andrew Bowman. Was it recorded? It was, yes. Where in Troop G was it recorded? It was recorded in an interview room, in an interview room adjacent to the uh, major crime office. Now, before we get to the third interview, I want to discuss with you some of the information that you learned between the defendant's June 6th interview and the August 13th interview. Is that all right? Absolutely, yes. And I just want to be clear to the court, I'm not offering this for the truth, merely to set up the course of the interview and what they learned in between. I want to uh, direct your attention to a Toyota Tacoma owned by Mr. Fabel Gubini. Yes. Did you learn additional information about that Tacoma during the course of the investigation between the second and third interview? Yes, we did. What did you learn? So amongst other things, we learned that uh, we have video of the Tacoma traveling to and from New Canaan on the day of Jennifer's murder, uh, May 24th. Your, Your Honor, I am going to object to this as um, being sort of a summary of what is somewhat contested evidence. So it's hearsay and what he learned, he can certainly talk about what subjects, but to go into the details, I submit is hearsay and can't cross-examine if it's not himself that even did these kind of things. So. Well, the offer is phrased this way. We learn. Now, that could mean from personal knowledge we observed it could mean during the course of the investigation, more information was developed. The offer essentially is going to what the state police decided to do as a result of further investigation. And so the court is going to overrule the objection. Yes, and I would just also note, I would also object on grounds of relevancy and materiality because it's allowing this witness to summarize <coughs> the police investigation rather than the jury deciding based on what the evidence has. Well, been. the state can present its evidence the way the state wants to present its evidence. Very well. Overruled. You indicated that there was information that the Tacoma had gone back and forth uh, to New Canaan. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Did you also receive additional DNA results during the course of the summer? We did. And were there any DNA results that were of note with respect to the defendant? Yes, we received the DNA result that indicated that uh, Shelter Conus's DNA was present on one of the bags seized from Albany Avenue. I'm going to also object that's a mischaracterization. There was a partial... Well, now, if, if an objection is an objection. Yeah. And testimony not under oath is testimony not under oath. Overruled. Just to be clear, you received a DNA report which indicated that there was a likelihood that Michelle Traconis was a contributor to a profile found on a garbage bag. Is that correct? That is accurate, yes. With respect to, um, oh, was there, was there also an additional DNA report from evidence uh, taken from the Tacoma? Yes, a blood or a blood-like substance swatch was removed from one of the seats in the Tacoma, and the DNA results for a testing of that swatch proved uh, indicated that it was consistent with the DNA from Jennifer Duos. Same objection, Your Honor. Overruled. Did you also learn information about an establishment known as Russell Speeder's Car Wash? Yes. What did you learn about that? We learned that on Wednesday, May 29th, uh, Michelle Traconis and uh, Fotis Dulos went to Russell Speeders, uh, where the Tacoma was dropped off to have it detailed. <clears throat> uh, 
And with respect to Pavel Bumini, did he provide a police interview as well uh, in the interim between the second and third interview? Yes, he did on July 12th. And uh, did he provide you information with respect to who had his keys on May 24th, 2019? He did. And uh, what did he indicate about his keys to the state police? On that, in that interview, he indicated that uh, on the day of Jennifer's murder. Uh, Objection. Well, I'd ask that that be stricken. First well, well, the witness is indicating what Mr. Gomeni said. I don't claim the the portion which I think Mr. Schoenhorn is objecting to. Perhaps I can just sharpen my question. Yes. Which he so indicated I'd that, ask that it be stricken. I, that's fine. He indicated on May 24th, all right, about his keys. All right, can you just tell the jury what he indicated to the state police about his Tacoma keys? Uh, he indicated that on May 24th, his keys from his Tacoma went missing, uh, and that went he Your Honor, I'm going to object. This is now not only hearsay, but it's mischaracterization of his testimony. Well, Mr. counsel, you have cross-examination concerning what may be considered to be a mischaracterization. This officer is testifying about what the investigation yielded such that certain areas were going to be explored at the third interview. They're not being offered for the truth as the court understands it. No, but his understanding of what he thinks the other people said is not relevant or material. Counsel, the court's view of the evidence is that this or these areas of inquiry concern what concerned the state police at that third interview. That's correct. Overruled. Uh, you may answer. So in his interview, Pavel Gwini indicated that when he was leaving 80 Mountain Spring, he saw his keys. When he returned to 80 Mountain Spring with photos Dulos, the keys to the coma were not there. And then Michelle Traconis eventually brought the keys back to 80 Mountain Spring. And that was all information that you learned between the defendant's June 6, 2019 interview and the August 13, 2019 interview. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And were those some of the subject matters that you sought to address with her in that August 13th interview? Yes. I want to um, now direct your attention to a restraining order application that was filed by the defendant. Are you familiar with that application? Yes, I am. Your Honor, I think we should have a sidebar at this point. This is, let's mark it. I think we need to have a little discussion about this.
defense objection is sustained. Detective Kimball, um, as part of your investigation, well, have you reviewed uh, residential surveillance footage in connection with this case? Yes. I have um, what has been marked as State's Exhibit 148, Your Honor, which is a disc. I should indicate to the court that this disc is essentially a composite of evidence which has already been admitted. Uh, specifically exhibits 84, 90, and 92. Um, and it also includes some screenshots from those exhibits. Um, so I'd offer that at this time. Yeah, I haven't finished, but it appears that I have no objection. So if, when we, if suddenly there's one that that I hadn't thought would, or that's improperly on here, I'll bring it up. But I, so far, I'm not finding any reason to object. It's just that there's many I can go through. Thank you. 148? Yes, sir. 148 admitted as false. Detective Kimball, just before I play uh, 148, uh, firstly, um, are you familiar with uh, the addresses of 1 Jefferson Crossing, 77 Mountain Spring Road, and 77 Eli Road? Yes, I am. And can you just indicate to the jury what town those uh, addresses are located in? Those are in Farmington. Right. And as part of the investigation, residential surveillance footage was seized. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And um, I believe there were, in some instances, multiple days that were seized. Is that correct? Multiple days. Yes, that's correct. All right. Well, we're going to focus today on May 24, 2019. Is that all right? Yes. Okay. So um, I'm actually going to ask if you wouldn't mind. Uh, you're going to be on your feet for a little bit. All right. That's fine. All right. So, Judge, um, within States 148, which is a disc labeled Kimball 216, 2024, um, there is a number of clips and still images. And I'm just going to begin. They're numbered 1 through 36. And I'm just going to begin with uh, clip number 1, if we could just open it and pause it so that we can orient the jury. So, uh, Detective Kimball, I'm just going to ask, could you just orient the jury in terms of what address this is uh, seized from? And could you also orient the jury as to the time? Sure, absolutely. This video is seized from 77 Mountain Spring Road, which is this property here. It shows the entrance in the upper right to 80 Mountain Spring Road. South is in this direction. Direction north is in this direction to the, to the left, where Fort Jefferson Crossing is located. You have timeline, or excuse me, a time stamp up top. That time stamp is inaccurate. It is one day, 24 hours, and 10 minutes fast. So it's reading 5 25 2019. It is actually 5 24 2019. And the time is reading 12 32 p.m. The time is actually 12 22 p.m. So anytime you see this, you have to remember that you have to go back one day and 10 minutes in time, and that's the actual time. So we're just going to play it at this point. Detective Kimball, um, was there anything of investigatory interest to you in this clip? Absolutely. In the upper right-hand corner, the gray or white driveway to 80 Mile Spring is shown. And at 1222 on the 24th of May, we see a vehicle matching or consistent with the description of the Toyota Tacoma arriving, pulling into the property from the, from the south. Incidentally, Detective, I should have asked you this earlier, but 
during your third interview with the defendant, did she ever indicate to you which vehicle she was driving on May 24th, 2019 in the afternoon? Michelle Traconis indicated she was driving the white Jeep Cherokee. All right. And I'm just going to pull up now file number two. Labeled 2, 1.32 p.m., 77 Eli. All right. So can you just orient the jury to what we're looking at here? Absolutely. This is surveillance from 77 Eli Road. So Mountain Spring is to the south, and the next road up to the north is Jefferson Crossing. So north is to the left, south is to the right. We're looking at Eli Road. Now, um, I want to direct your attention to the white vehicle in the top center of the photograph. What type of vehicle is that? That appears to be a Jeep, white Jeep Cherokee. All right. And you indicated the defendant said she was operating a white Jeep Cherokee? That's correct. And um, in case I missed it, oh, I didn't, yeah. to the right is 80 Mountain. 80 Mountain would be to the right, to the south, and Jefferson Crossing would be to the left, to the north. All right. Oh, uh, and this is 1.32 p.m., is that correct? That's correct. This, uh, the timestamp is down here. It's really probably not readable to the um, jury. And this Your Honor, I, I'm not going to do this for each one, but what it appears that this is all evidence that's already in. We now have a witness who wasn't there, who didn't even collect it. But what's this, the objection? What's the ground? The objection is it's based on hearsay, it's irrelevant, and it's already in evidence, and therefore it's a waste of time to have this witness re-describe evidence that's already been testified. Well, the court understands this entire offer to encompass what areas were going to be explored with the defendant at the third interview. Now, if the state represents that these areas will not be explored with the defendant at the third interview, then this is a needless presentation of cumulative evidence. If the state indicates these areas are going to be explored with the defendant at the third interview, the court would overrule the objection. The, the trips back and forth from 80 Mountain to Fort Jefferson Crossing were absolutely explored during the third interview. And I also just want to respond to the hearsay objection. The defendant's words are not hearsay. They're admissions by a party opponent. And so that objection is not well taken. She indicated that she was driving the Jeep Cherokee. I'm not objecting. Let me be clear. I'm not objecting to that. I'm, asked, I'm objecting to this witness describing what he was told about what's in these videos. Yeah. And my, that's my concern. The court that's has concern. articulated its reasons for overruling the objection. <laughs> Next clip is uh, three. All right. Is this still 77 Eli Road? This is still 77 Eli Road. And what is the time, sir? The time stamp down here is 1333, which is 1.33 p.m. on May 24th. And uh, there appears to be a black um, SUV-type vehicle in the photograph. Do you recognize that vehicle? I do. And what is that vehicle, sir? A vehicle is consistent with the, suit, the uh, Chevy Suburban, Chevrolet Suburban, uh, owned by Flores Dulos. And how do you know that? Uh, the general appearance of the vehicle, the Thule rack on the top, and there is a uh, magnetic four-group sign adhered to the uh, passenger, front passenger door. And incidentally, uh, during your third interview with the defendant, did she indicate that she was driving the white Jeep Cherokee and Mr. Doulis was driving the Suburban? Yes. And that's the Suburban? Yes. And uh, now we're going to play number file number four. I'm just going to play it, and then I'll ask you about it.
Okay, firstly, what address is this taken from? This is surveillance from 77 Mountain Spring showing 80 Mountain Spring Road. And um, in that particular clip that we just watched, what, what did you see of investigatory interest? So just to remind the jury, north is up here, Jefferson Crossing is up here. Uh, the time <coughs> is 5 24 2019, 1.36 p.m. And what I saw was a white Jeep Cherokee coming from the direction of Fort Jefferson Crossing, pulling into the driveway of 80 Mountain Spring, and less than a minute later, a black Chevy Suburban coming from the direction of Fort, uh, Fort Jefferson Crossing, pulling into 80 Mountain Spring Road. Number five. <clears throat> uh, what are we looking at here, sir? We're again looking from 77 to 80 Mount Spring Road. And what is the time here? The time here is 1.41 p.m. All right. And uh, I want to direct your attention to the upper right-hand portion of the photo. Do you see that white vehicle? I do, sir. Now, this is obviously a still shot. Um, however, can you just explain to the jury why this is significant to the investigation? This is the white Jeep Cherokee leaving 80 Mountain Spring at 1.41 p.m., turning right towards Fort Jefferson Crossing. So this is roughly how long after the vehicles arrived? Uh, you can ask me to do math. Uh, oh my God. Maybe it'd be uh, easier just go to the other. Go back to the clip from 36 to, to 41. All right. Five, five minutes. Okay. And uh, is this from 77 Eli Road, number six? Yes, yes, this is. And what's the time? It's in the lower hood. I believe it's 145. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, all right. And I want to direct your attention to the vehicle in the uh, upper left-hand portion of the photograph. What type of vehicle is that? It appears to be a white Jeep Cherokee. And what direction is it headed? It's coming from the direction of 80 Mountain Spring, traveling north towards Fort Jefferson Crossing. Clip number seven. All right. Uh, we're still at 77 Eli Road here in file number seven or image number seven, I should say. Yes. And uh, what, what is the time? It's 1.58 p.m. And uh, directing your attention specifically to the vehicle, what type of vehicle does that appear to be? That appears to be a white Jeep Cherokee. And is it heading in the general direction of 80 Mountain Spring Road? It's heading from the direction of Jefferson Crossing towards 80 Mountain Spring. And this is uh, image eight. And we're back at 77 Mountain Road, is that correct? That's correct. And what's the uh, time, sir? 2.01 p.m. And uh, was there anything of investiga investigative significance in this image? Noted a vehicle consistent with the white Jeep Cherokee coming from the direction of Fort Jefferson, pulling into the driveway of 80 Mountain Spring Road. All right, and we're going to move on to number nine. Still at 77 Mountain in this clip? That's correct. <laughs> what are we looking at? So we're looking at a vehicle consistent with a white Jeep Cherokee pulling out of the driveway of 80 Mountain Spring, turning right, traveling north towards Fort, Fort Jefferson Crossing. And what's the uh, date and time here? Uh, date would be 5 24 2019 at 2025 at this point. All right. I'm not going to ask you to do math this time. We'll just go to the next clip. Uh, this is image number 10. We're back at 77 Eli. That's correct. And uh, directing your attention to the vehicle, what type of vehicle does that appear to be? It appears to be a white Jeep Cherokee. 
And uh, maybe for the final time, we'll just worry at the jury, as vehicles are going right to left in this photograph, they'd be heading in the general direction of Fort Jefferson Crossing, is that correct? They're going from right to left, yes, correct. Eating Mountain Spring is to the right, Jefferson Crossing is to the left. And uh, did I ask you the time? You did not, but it appears to be 2.28 p.m. All right, pause it. All right, I'm just going to pause it there. Um, just, if you could, just orient the jury to what we're looking at here. All right. So this is Jefferson Crossing, the road. Eli Road is off to the right. <coughs> this road runs east-west. This residence right here is for Jefferson Crossing, where Fotis Dulos and Michelle Traconis resided together. This is from the perspective of one Jefferson Crossing, the residence directly across the street, looking south at four. And I believe this is the Swanson's residence, is that right? Yes, correct. Okay. And um, if we just play the clip. Actually, just before, if we could just pause it at 13 seconds. Um, I want to just orient the jury to Fort Jefferson Crossing here, if we could. Fort Jefferson Crossing has multiple chimneys, is that correct? That's correct, yes. All right, I want to direct your attention to the chimney on the far left. If you could just point that out for the jury. And you're indicating with your right index finger, basically the dead center of the photograph. Is that correct? Correct. All right. Um, is there any smoke coming out of the chimney? There does not appear to be any smoke coming out of that east chimney. And the time is uh, Incidentally, is this a motion activated camera, if you know? Yes, this is a ring camera, so this camera only activates when there's motion within a close proximity to the camera. Understood. And we're just going to go on to um, image number 12. All right. Um, with respect to image number 12, we're still at one Jefferson Crossing, is that correct? Correct. Looking at four. All right, just going to play the clip now, and um, I'm going to ask if you could uh, focus on that chimney. you see anything coming out of the chimney? Your Honor, I have to object. The jury can see whatever they can see, what this witness says or how he's going to interpret what's in these videos is, I suggest, his lay opinion. The jury is perfectly able to see whatever it is that is in the video. Wow. Well, the, the, the court agrees with counsel's uh, objection, but the issue of the chimney apparently is part of the state's case. So the court is going to allow the specificity concerning the chimney, but the observation is up to the jury. All right. Um, if we could just replay that. And I'll ask you again, do you see smoke coming out of the chimney? All right. And if you could just indicate with your right index finger where it is. Chimney's right there.
Detective Kimball, just while that video is playing, would this have been before or after that vehicle consistent with the white Jeep Cherokee was observed heading back in the general direction of Fort Jefferson Crossing? This video is after the white Jeep Cherokee was seen heading towards Fort Jefferson. <coughs> and uh, image 13 in that same photo. <coughs> Is this still seven, uh, excuse me, one Jefferson Crossing? Yes, it is. And does there appear to be smoke? There does not appear to be smoke rising from that East Tribune. The time for this is 3.12 p.m. And now we're going to go to uh, 14. And uh, just direct your attention back to that same chimney. Does there appear to be smoke? This is 3.25 p.m. And there appears to be smoke coming out of the east chimney of Fort Jefferson Crossing. Incidentally, um, when you spoke with the defendant on August 13th, uh, did she indicate to you uh, whether or not she ever returned to Fort Jefferson Crossing after having initially gone to 80 Mountain Spring Road? She indicated she did, yes. And did she tell you where Mr. Dulos was during that time period? She indicated when she was returning to Fort Jefferson, Mr. Dulos remained at 80 Mountain Spring. <laughs> Image number 15. All right, so we're back at 77 Eli, is that correct? That's correct. What's the time? Uh, 3.53 p.m. And uh, directing your attention to the vehicle displayed in the photograph, what does that vehicle appear to be? It appears to be a white Jeep Cherokee. And it's heading in the direction of 80 Mountain, is that correct? Coming away from Fort Jefferson, heading towards 80 Mountain Spring Road. And we're back at 77 Mountain in image. That's correct. Mountains. Looking at 80. I think this is image 16. All right. So what's the date and the time here? The corrected date is 5-24-2019. The corrected time would be 3 at this point, 3-50-6. Um, PM. And uh, the first vehicle that went by in the video, what did that vehicle appear to be? It appeared to be a white Jeep Cherokee. And where did it go? It came from Fort Jefferson Crossing, the direction of, and it entered the driveway of 80 Mountain Spring Road. Number 17.
All right, so that is 77 Mountain Spring Road, correct? Correct. And the corrected time is May 24th, 2019 at about 4.03 p.m. Is that a correct? correct? That's correct. And uh, can you indicate to the jury whether or not you witness any vehicles exiting the 80 Mountain Spring Road driveway? Yes, a vehicle consistent with the black Chevy Suburban exited 80 Mountain Spring, took a right on the Mountain Spring Road traveling north towards Fort Jefferson Cross. Um, incidentally, uh, during your third interview with the defendant, did she ever indicate to you whether or not she drove the black Suburban back to Fort Jefferson Crossing? Yes, she indicated that she had parked the white Jeep Cherokee and because of the way she parked it, she needed to take the black Chevy Suburban. So she indicated she did take the <coughs> Chevy Suburban at some point. This is image 18. Back at 77 Eli, directing your attention to the date and time, please. Uh, date 524, 2019. Time is 407 p.m. And uh, directing your attention to the vehicle. Um, do you know which vehicle that is? That appears to be the uh, Chevy Suburban owned by Fotos Dulos. You have the vehicle description and you have a Thule on top. And it's heading back towards Fort Jefferson. And Crossing. it's heading from 80 towards Fort Jefferson. <laughs> Image 19. What uh, time and uh, date is Image 19? Date is 524, 2019. The time is 420 p.m. And uh, I want to direct your attention to the vehicle. Uh, what, what vehicle is that? This appears to be the Chevy Suburban owned by Fotis Dulos. Uh, you have the general vehicle appearance, the Thule rack, and on the right-hand passenger door, the uh, four group magnetic sign. And it's coming from the direction of Fort Jefferson, heading towards 80 Mountain Spring. Image 20. So image 20, we're back at 77 Mountain, is that correct? That's correct. And the corrected time, May 24, 2019, at approximately 4.23 in the afternoon? Correct. All right. Um, I want to direct your attention to the vehicle that drove by. Uh, which vehicle did that appear to be, and where did it go? That appeared to be the black Chevy Suburban, owned by Fotis Dulos, coming from the direction of Fort Jefferson Crossing well, and driving into... Characterizing who was driving it, he could only describe <coughs> the vehicle, but he's you know, narrating his own opinion, which is well, not even set forth in the... Well, the court heard the testimony as, and perhaps the court didn't hear it correctly, owned by Fotis Dulos. Oh, I'm sorry, I withdraw my objection. And just to clarify, the defendant actually indicated to you that she went to 80 Mountain Spring Road with the Suburban at some point, is that That's correct, correct yes. Or excuse me, Fort Jefferson with the suburb. What from eighty to Fort Jefferson? Yes. Okay. We plan to take the recess in five minutes. Yes, Judge. I will try to. I'll endeavor to finish this. I'm sorry. This is, this is image twenty-one. Excuse me. Um, image 21 is the, this corrected date is May 24, 2019 at 4.58 p.m., correct? That's correct. <clears throat> and um, directing your attention to the vehicle in the um, image, what vehicle does that appear to be? Appears to be the 2014 Ford Raptor owned by Fotos Dulos. And it's turning into 80 Mountain? And it's turning into 80 Mountain Road, coming from the north, coming from the direction of Fort Jefferson. <laughs> All right. And uh, image 22A, did you just indicate to the jury what we're looking at here? This is from 77 Mountain Spring, looking at 80. 
and what what I see is what appears to be the Raptor having pulled out of the 80 Mountain Spring Road driveway, turning right and traveling north towards Fort Jefferson. And uh, I, did you say the date and time? Uh, date four, uh, excuse me, 524, 2019, time 502 p.m. Image 22B. Corrected date and time May 24, 2019 at 502 p.m. I want to direct your attention to the upper right hand portion of the photograph. Could you just indicate to the jury what we're looking at there? I see what appears to be the white Jeep Cherokee backing out of 80 Mountain Spring Road onto Mountain Spring Road facing north. Twenty two C. This is the same camera looking at 80. Jeep Cherokee apparently is stationary on Mountain Spring Road and the black Chevy Suburban is pulling forward out of 80 Mountain Spring Road. Twenty two D. Looking at 80 Mountain Spring, the black Chevy Suburban has turned right out of 80 Mountain Spring Road and is heading at 5.03 p.m. It's heading northbound towards Fort Jefferson Crossing. The white Jeep Cherokee remains stationary, parked on Mountain Spring Road facing north. And uh, the defendant indicated to you uh, during her interview um, that Mr. Dulos was driving the Suburban at this point. Is that correct? Or what did she say about that? She, she indicated that he was driving the Suburban and she was driving the uh, Chevy, excuse me, the Jeep, and that Pavel Galani was had been driving the Raptor. <laughs> Number twenty-three. What are we looking at here? This is one Jefferson Crossing, looking across the street at Fort Jefferson Crossing at five oh three. PM. And does there appear to be any smoke coming out of that chimney? There does not appear to be any smoke rising from the east chimney. I just want to direct your attention in the same clip to this young man's garments. What does he appear to be wearing? Here, I'm, I'm going I'm to object again. Relevance. Relevance and at show, previously shown exhibit. Well, I'll tell you the relevance, Judge, is that I don't know too many people that are having a fire on a day like this. So that's the relevance of it. Well, well. It's uh, a runner. <laughs> the court is going to sustain the objection. Very well, Judge. <clears throat> this is image 24. What are we looking at here? This is 77 Eli. We're looking at a vehicle that appears to be the white Jeep Cherokee traveling north from 80 Mountain Spring or from the direction of 80 Mountain Spring towards Fort Jefferson Crossing. And this would have been after the vehicles had left 80 Mountain Spring that we saw earlier, correct? Yes, this was 506 p.m. Approximately three minutes later. Court's going to stand in the morning recess. Ladies and gentlemen, please do not discuss the case.
taking a recess every hour? I don't think so. Um, however, uh, that, you know. Well, when does the state, well, of course, there, there's cross-examination. If, if the state started the interviews at 12 o'clock, Did it intend to inquire of the witness during the course of the interview? Yes, sir. So the entire interview probably will not be being today. So uh, we'll stand in our recess until a, about, well, let's call it 1150. Stand in a recess.
Please not open in session. Judge, may I just ask Madam Monitor a brief question? We can bring it here. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Wait, Council stipulate, please. Yes, Judge. Thank you. Yeah. Detective Kimball, I believe we left off at image uh, 24, so we're going to pick it back up at 25. I just want to indicate the 77 Mountain Spring Road exhibit is 81, not 84. All right. All right, image 25. What are we looking at here, sir? This is 77 Mountain Spring looking at 80. And we have a vehicle consistent. The time is 514. Uh, the vehicle shown is consistent with Ford Raptor coming from the uh, direction of Fort Jefferson. And it's going to pull into 80 Mountain Spring Road. This is uh, 77 Eli, is that correct? Correct, yes. And what's the time here? Uh, 5.21 p.m. And uh, can you indicate for the jury what vehicle is displayed in this image? It appears to be the uh, Chevy Chevrolet Suburban owned by Fotos Dulos. And what direction is it headed? It's coming from Fort Jefferson, heading towards 80 Mountain Spring. Image uh, 27. We're back at 77 Mountain Road, is that correct? That's correct. What's the time? The time is 5.23 p.m. And what do we see? We're looking at 80 Mountain Spring the driveway and we're seeing a vehicle which appears to be the black Chevrolet Suburban coming from Fort Jefferson, the uh, direction of Fort Jefferson, and it pulls into the 80 Mountain Spring driver, driveway. Image 28A. What's the date and time? What are we looking at here? The date is 524 2019, and the time is 527 p.m. And directing your attention to the vehicle in the upper right hand corner near the timestamp? Yes. What is that? It appears to be the Chevrolet Suburban. Uh, it's come out of 80 Mountain Spring. It's turned right on Mountain Spring. It's traveling north towards Fort Jefferson Crossing. Incidentally, um, during your August 13th interview with the defendant, did you have a conversation with her about the transfer of the keys back to the Bell Mini? Yes. And did the defendant ever indicate to you in that third interview that she went back to 80 Mountain Spring Road to bring the keys? She indicated she did not. Thank you. All right, 28B, what are we looking at? 5-24-2019, the time is 5-27 p.m. And the vehicle appears to be the red Toyota Tacoma owned by, owned by Barbara Gomeni, Pavel's wife. It has come out of 80 Mountain Spring, turned right on Mountain Spring, and is traveling towards uh, Fort Jefferson. It's also going towards the direction of 585 Deercliff Road. 28C. All right. What's the uh, time here? 
Time here is 5.28 p.m. on the 24th of May. And direct your attention to the vehicle in the photo. Uh, it appears to be the black Ford Raptor, which is traveling from 80 Mountain Spring north towards Fort Jefferson Cross. Image number 29, are we back at 77 Eli? We are, sir. And what vehicle is displayed in this photograph? This appears to be the black Chevrolet Suburban uh, owned by Fotis Dulos, traveling from the direction of 80 Mountain Spring towards the direction of Fort Jefferson Crossing. Image number 30. Uh, this is a different image than we've seen. Um, can you just orient the jury to what we're looking at? So this is also a camera from one Jefferson Crossing. The camera that we initially saw directly faced for Jefferson Crossing. This camera is slightly to the west and oriented almost on a, on a diagonal from the other camera. But this is still one Jefferson Crossing showing for Jefferson Crossing and showing Jefferson Crossing the road itself. Eli Road is out here. And just a short circuit this, and I probably should have done this sooner, but all these images are from May 24th, is that correct? All of these images are May 24th. Right, so what's the time? Direct you to the bottom right hand corner. What's, I'm the, sorry, time? Hear you. what's the time displayed in this image? Uh, 5.31 p.m. What are we looking at there? So the camera is activated because the homeowner is moving in his driveway. And what we see is the homeowner leave. And same general time, we see uh, a black Chevrolet Suburban coming down Jefferson Crossing from the direction of Eli Road and driving into the driveway before Jefferson Crossing going under the archway and turning left. And image uh, 31. This is 77 Eli, correct? No. I'm sorry. 376 Deercliff. Oh, I'm sorry. 376 Deercliff. Um, and what are we looking at here? So the time is 557. Deercliff Road is actually Eli Road in Avon. So as you travel north on Eli, you're on the same road, but it is now Deercliff Road. And what I see is a vehicle that appears to be the red Toyota Tacoma, uh, operated by or owned by Pavel Guamini and his wife Barbara, uh, traveling northbound on Deercliff. And in the back of the vehicle appears to be a motorcycle and a plank extending to the rear. Uh, so they're tri they're, he's coming from the area of 585 Deer Cliff. He's traveling north towards Simsbury, where he lives. Understood. Image 32. Council, how many images are there? 36, Judge. Thank you. This is uh, one Jefferson Crossing, correct? Correct. And what's the time? The time here is uh, 5.59 p.m. Okay. And uh, does it appear that there's any smoke coming out of the chimney in this particular image of Fort Jefferson Crossing? There does not appear to be any smoke coming from the east chimney of Fort Jefferson Crossing.
image uh, 33. We're still at one Jefferson Crossing, correct? Correct. I want to direct your attention to that same chimney. Does there appear to be smoke coming out? There now appears to be smoke coming out of the east chimney of Fort Jefferson Crossing at uh, 6.42 p.m. Incidentally, uh, during your first two interviews with the defendant, did she ever indicate to you whether or not anyone had lit in a fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing on May 24th? She did not, no. Image 34. Uh, what's the time here? It's two minutes past the, la the last frame. It's 6.44 p.m. And uh, does there appear to be smoke coming out of the chimney at Fort Jefferson Crossing? There appears to be smoke coming out of the east chimney of Fort Jefferson Crossing. So as I understand it, there's three separate smoke events separated by periods of non-smoke. Is that correct? That's correct. Image 35. And what's the time here? The time here is 7.02 p.m. And does there appear to be smoke coming out of the chimney in this image? There does appear to be smoke coming out of the chimney for Jefferson Crossing. And image 36. <clears throat> What's the time here? The time here is 8.12. And what are we looking at? We're looking at Fort Jefferson Crossing. Vehicle consistent with the Ford Raptor pulls in from the direction of Eli. Party gets out of the driver's seat. Consistent with the appearance of photos Dulos, as seen on Albany Avenue video and as seen at the <coughs> Starbucks, West Hartford. Goes to the mailbox. I'm going to object, I'm object to the narration. He was asked what he's seen, and he's now given us a narration about things that are not anywhere near this video. So I ask that that be strict and not response. Well, it's I, really, the response really called for other questions. So you can target your question. Sure. Uh, you indicated that there appears to be a figure exit the vehicle, which appears to be the Ford Raptor, correct? That's correct, yes. And who does that figure appear to be, Detective? That figure appeared to be Fos Dulos. Okay. <clears throat> 
Now, um, you can have a seat. Judge, I have uh, what has been marked as State's Exhibit 149. It's the defendant's entire third interview. I move it into evidence at this time. No objection. Well, actually, may just have a moment. Objection. 149 admitted as false. Judge, if I could just have this uh, remarked. Detective Kimball, approximately what time of day did you interview the defendant? I honestly don't remember. All right, but there's a timestamp. There's a timestamp, and it's accurate. All right, was the defendant in custody when you interviewed her on August 13th? She was not, no. Did she appear to be under the influence of any alcohol, drugs, or medication? No. Did she request the assistance of a Spanish interpreter for the third interview? She did not. This time I'm going to publish the exhibit to the jury. Would you just uh, mind describing the interview room for the members of the jury? Sure. The interview room, it's generally square. It's probably about 15 by 15 feet. Um, it has two doors. Um, from where the defendant was sitting, there would be a door. There was a door to her left, which went into the major crime office. And then there was a door straight ahead of her, which went to a hallway at Troop G. And the room is equipped with cameras and audio equipment. And we've got one camera that's sort of facing the end of the table, and that's the, the angle that's the predominant angle in this uh, video. Is that correct? That's correct. And then there's a camera, I guess, in the upper corner of the room, which... Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, it shows the door. It's the inset <coughs> square in the video. And uh, does this uh, time stamp uh, refresh your memory as to approximately what time you interviewed the defendant? Yes, we interviewed her approximately 12.49 p.m. on August 13, 2019. Oh, and uh, <clears throat> who was the other detective assisting you during the interview? Uh, detective Corey Clabby. Do the same thing, Michelle. Closing that just for privacy, okay? okay. So the same stuff. Yeah. Uh, um, you're not here uh, under any kind of custody. You're here. 
attorney in development of the black team. If you need breaks, you're welcome to take breaks. You may need breaks. Um, your attorney may need breaks. Um, if you want that Coca Cola I offered you, let me know. Um, you can leave any time you want. You can take a break any time you want. Uh, I'm glad you came in. This is our third conversation. Um, and that honestly is two more conversations than most people have. So it's our feeling that the way it looks now is you may be looking like you are involved and you actually are. So we're trying to get you, give you an opportunity to kind of explain what's going on and put things in perspective and context. All right. Okay. Just, what do you mean that I need both of them? Okay. Well, obviously, we're talking about the disappearance of possible murder of Jeff. Okay. And one of the people that we're looking at as being involved in that, as far as it was your former living boyfriend. So uh, there's a lot of indications that you have, you should have some knowledge of what's going on. Okay. And there's been, during the first interview, there were some things that you said that we suspected might not be 100% accurate. Subsequent to that, there was a second interview. Subsequent to that, and before this interview, which is number three, there's a lot of evidence that they were not truthful. So when, when you impart truthful with us, it makes us wonder exactly where you are on the spectrum of involvement. So we think focus is close to 100%. We're not sure where you fall, and we want you to clarify where on that line you fall. The way you can do that is you have to be honest with us. You understand that? And we understand this is tough for you. We know this. We know English is not your first language. There are very few people in this room right now. I know the last time we talked, there were several people in the room. It's not going to be a lot of talking over everything. I'm going to give you as much time as you need to think about things. If you don't understand a question, you're more than welcome to have, you know, ask us to rephrase it or re ask it. Um, but we just we need to get to what actually happened. Leading up to and on the 24th of May and following the 24th of May. Okay? And we need you to be 100% forthcoming and honest. And you're just going to develop yourself. We want you to do that. We know, we know there may be some things to show that you don't honestly know the answer to, and that's acceptable, but we know that there are things that you absolutely should know the answer to. And um, we need to clarify. We've gone through some of these things already. And uh, like I said, um, this is just one thing we prepared. So we have literally a topic in interview one, what you said, interview two, what you said, and the other. And this is, I'm just showing you this. I may need to refer to this throughout the interview. I hope I don't, because I hope that you're kind of, you know, sort of being truthful. Okay, we're not, we're not here to feed you. Really, we want the information that we know you have. Okay, and we're here to listen. So we really need you to tell us, starting from the beginning, oh, until you get now, everything. Three months have gone by just about. What we knew when we first met was this, to this, to this. You know, like I said, we were just students. This is what we do. First time we've done this. So, just not even getting into our resume, just trust that, and we want to hear it. So, there have been people who have sat in the chair you're sitting in right now in the past who have done similar, who have told similar stories to what you told during the first and second interview, who have ended up in prison. Uh, we don't want that to happen to you. Okay, no, so you're, you're giving me the conversation. Sorry. This really is an opportunity for you, right? Are you ready? Are you ready to admit that you want 100% truth for what else to the first thing you see? That should be an easy answer. That should be an easy answer. Yes. Okay. So we're willing to listen. If you want to start from the very beginning. I'm just going to pause it at the timestamp 1254.44. Did the defendant admit that she wasn't 100% truthful during the first 
two interviews? Objection. That's not what it says. He's asking to characterize the answer. It's very clear. It's an ambiguous answer. Well, the jury heard the video. And so it may not be a judicious use of the court's time to repeat what the jury has heard sustained. Detective, after the defendant indicated yes, when you asked her whether she was ready to admit that she had not been 100% truthful, did that impact how you were going to conduct the interview going forward? Objection. Misstates the evidence before her answer. So that should be an easy answer. And then she said yes. Okay. Well, not what Mr. Overruled. Did that impact how you were going to conduct the interview? Absolutely. We are seeking the truth. We are seeking the truth from her. And what happened to Jennifer? Both how this all became, how it started, how it happened, and what well, you know. We will sit here and we will be quiet. Well, why don't you start with Wednesday before that would be May 23, when, when uh, I'm sorry, May 22, when photos um, went to the camera. Okay, let's just start with. Okay. Um, usually on Wednesdays he would go and see his kids in, in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And I would take those days or those Wednesdays to go out with my daughter Nicole. Mm -hmm. That Wednesday I went uh, with Nicole and Kim Rouse and Lauren, who's the daughter. We went to West Hartford to have a sushi <coughs> at um, a restaurant uh, in West Hartford. Mm -hmm. And I think we met there around seven. Um, the, the four of us. And I know I texted a, I usually focus would go to Grace Farms mm -hmm. to spend time with the kids and, and he had supposed to be a supervisor because mm -hmm. he didn't know. And I texted him and I saw that the text didn't go through. Okay. And so I, I don't remember what I said. Like, are you with the kids? Are you enjoying the kids? I don't, I don't know if I don't remember exactly, but I wrote something. Okay. And uh, I saw that it didn't go through. Like, it didn't read the message. Not that it didn't read, like, it didn't. I don't know how you say it. When you block someone, but you don't see okay. the verbs, or I call them the verbs. So I put him like a finger. I said, okay. With a bow and a finger. Yes. Okay. And then I went up and I never never spoke. I we had dinner, we finished dinner, we went to Icy Rolls. We were the last ones because Nicole was the last one to order an ice cream. Um, and that probably if they close at night, maybe we were there just before my two minutes to work. And Nicole had her ice cream, and then we went back to the car, they went to their home, and I went to Nicole to uh, for Jefferson. Mm -hmm. And I arrived, and I think Focus was already there. Uh, and well, obviously I put Nicole to bed, like what I always do. Uh, I asked how it was, he said it was good, like always, with the kids, that they love me, they say hi, mm -hmm. um, and that was it. And then Thursday, a, well, I wake up at the same time, no sorry, Thursdays, a little bit later because Nicole starts school on Thursday uh, at 9 instead of at 8. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any discussion with Lotus about the fact that he didn't pick up the, that he didn't pick up the text? Or that he I did, but I, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't right away. It was at some point, okay. but it wasn't that night, or it wasn't that morning. Um, well, 
So I wake up, I take showers, I put my, usually my, my gym clothes. I take me home to school. On the way, we stop in Starbucks. This is Thursday? Yes, Thursday. Thursday. Okay. Um, because usually on Thursdays, I don't cook for her in the morning, I don't do breakfast. We just stop in Starbucks. That's like our mm-hmm. routine. And then I drop her off. And then I went to the house. I don't know if I went jogging, but I don't remember that. But usually I go back to the house. Um, I go. I go to the supermarket because we were having a dinner that night. Um, also, Nicole, on Wednesday, she told me that she needed oranges for a juice on Friday to take to the classroom. So I believe I bought the, the oranges that day. Um, I went to my friend's uh, store uh, to pay those, uh, to grab some rocks. Uh, because Stefan and Beth, mm-hmm. they wanted to see my rocks to see if they wanted to buy mm-hmm. um, well, I say, picked up Nicole in, in school and we went to the house. Um, Stefan and Beth, they arrived around five. Uh, I showed them the rocks that they were in the office, on Otis' office. Mm-hmm. Um, I really liked them, I gave them an explanation. I, I usually have a presentation in my computer with price lists. Mm-hmm. And I had it there just in case they asked. I was just showing them. So you sell on Instagram? Huh? The rocks you sell on Instagram? That's all. You still have them on Instagram? Well, I don't sell them on Instagram, but I have them posted. Okay, posted, okay. I have it, it's called Patagonia style. Right. I have drugs on Instagram to show pictures of drugs. Uh, of, um, this is a business I just started this year. Um, the owner of this company of the lot is a friend of mine who had prior when I used to live in Argentina. I used to buy them, pay the ship skins, the drugs for the ski resort. So I called him in December, and I don't know if this is interesting. Let's, let's stay on track. Yeah, let's stay on track. So then I took them in the house. Mm-hmm. So we walked out of the office to the TV room, and I showed them a green one that I had there. Then we went all the way to the room. I showed them the one that I had in the master bedroom. Then we went down. I showed them the one that I had in the family room, coffee box, and they were delighted. And they said, you know, the typical, oh, I would like to have a beige, but in this size, I don't know. They were kind of figuring out which one they wanted for them, but they were going to tell me not that one later. And then we went to the kitchen and we started getting the, the food ready. Um, I already had the meat out. Renata was there cleaning the house all day. Um, uh, I think by the time I went to the kitchen, I think Renata left. I'm not 100%, but I think she said goodbye. Um, oh, I take the meat, I, I, you know, uh, the meat that I had was frozen, but I took it out during the, the afternoon. Um, I got it ready, then we started cutting to do the green salad and eating potatoes. Um, and we were in the kitchen. Stefan, Beth, me, uh, at some point, Otis was present, and at, in a, a moment, Otis, we, were, we didn't have enough of meat. So he went uh, supposedly to the supermarket to buy meat. Mm-hmm. And, what market you went to? Uh, what market you went to? But, 
I mean, probably stop and shop or you buy a lot from That's right. Meat so, okay. Or meat. okay. So you thought you had enough meat that turned out you didn't, so sometime before this left. To buy meat. Right. What time is that? What time? Yeah. About. If they arrived at five. Just after five, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, you know, you know what was that night. So we didn't go to the supermarket. Well, what did you tell us? Why did you tell us what you... Oh, well, I came with a piece of meat. Okay. The supermarket. So yeah, tell us about what I ran into you. Well, he came back okay. with a piece of meat. Okay. I, I opened it and I cleaned it up. Okay. Um, and then right in uh, Hodge and Aaron arrived mm-hmm. uh, around, I believe, seven. Okay. And he made a year here, and but it was some time around there. Okay. Um, and then, oh, we were having wine. I think Focus offered wine uh, to Hodge and Aaron. Mm-hmm. And then they, the three of them went outside to cook the meat and the french fries. And it was raining, but not like hard rain. Okay. So we were decided in, to eat inside or outside. We decided to eat outside on the porch. And we put the table outside, me and, and, and Beth and Aaron Hill. And then we ate probably around eight. We cooked down, we sat outside and we ate. And while we were hanging on the table talking, blah, blah, blah. at some point I go upstairs to put people to bed. And I spoke with my sister, I like a long conversation. Okay. I put the call to bed, I go down, and Aaron and Hush were gone, they left, and Stefan and Beth they were there, and I was both, mm-hmm. and we were hanging in the kitchen, they, they were washing the things mm-hmm. from the dinner, and then at some point they did. Okay. I don't know, it was 10. Uh, uh, we went to watch TV. We? Oh, we in focus. Um, and then at some point, obviously, we were falling asleep. We go upstairs and we go to, to sleep in mm-hmm. the bed. And then Nicole calls me up. 1259. How did she call you? On the phone? Yes. I got her. Did you call your phone or did she use the app? No, no, she calls me on her phone. She, does she have WhatsApp? Yes, I heard the kid. I was on the phone. But she called me. No, it cannot be because if I found it in the ATT logs. Okay. So she called me from the red room. And like a house phone? Oh, no, no. So, we so, took it from okay. her cell phone to Is house there a house phone in the house? Is there a hard line? There's no hard line to collect at the house. Is there a hard line going into the office? I, I never saw a phone. No, it's a big house. So you have to use your cell phone? We use the cell phone all the time. Okay, it's a big house. Right? It's a 15,000 square feet. Big house, yeah. Okay. From one side, I mean, we need to call each other from the phone to get over inside the house. Okay. That's a, something that we do on a regular basis. Alright, so 12 15 then you call the phone. Alright, so you guys are watching TV. Focus. Okay, before going to bed, yes. Okay, so continue from there. Then I guess we were falling asleep in the couch and we go up to the bedroom. Mm-hmm. And. No, I was. Obviously, sleeping, Nicole calls me at 12.59 that it was raining hard, mm-hmm. and it was. 
uh, and I go and I go to sleep with her. Mm -hmm. um, and then on Friday, uh, the alarm goes on. Usually, I have the alarms at six forty. Um, I go to my bed, to my bedroom. I take shower, take a change. I want to just ask you. So normally the alarm is six forty. Was it six forty that way? Yes. Okay. Yes. So your alarm went off at six forty. Well, the calls alarm also. I think she has it at 6.35 or 6.30. Okay. I think. I think okay. she has it like 10 minutes before me, but okay. not 100%. Okay. By night, for sure, it's at 6.30. Somewhere around 6.30, 6.40. Which alarm was it that went off to your bed? Well, hers and mine was in my room. Okay. So what way? What woke you up? The police alarm. So Nicole, Nicole's alarm wakes you up. Yeah. Do you shut it off or does Nicole shut it off because it just keeps happening? No, she did. Okay. Because it was on her side. She and you, and you get up? The um, night table is on her side. She sleeps here and I usually sit and, uh, next to the bathroom. Okay, so you get up and then what do you do? I go to the to my room. Okay. To my is your alarm going off? My alarm, I think I turned it off. I think my alarm went up, what's was going on? So as you walked into the bedroom, was the alarm going off? I'm not 100%, but I'm, I assume that yes, because that's, I have the alarm set up, but I'm not 100%. Okay. But I woke up. I mean, okay. I wasn't safe. And then what happened from the, so you shut your, your alarm off in your bedroom. What happens then? Um, oh, take a shower, go to the bathroom, brush my teeth, get dressed, and go downstairs, do that breakfast for me. Okay. When, you're, when you shut your alarm off between 6.30 and 6.40 in the morning, this is a very important question, okay? This kind of goes to, well, this is kind of, it goes to whether you're going to be truthful. When you shut off your alarm in your bedroom at 6 30, 6 40 a.m., what is it? What is it? This is a question. When you set your alarm, when you turn your alarm off in your bedroom, was focus there? Mm. It was out there. Mm. You did not take a shower with mm. That was a lie. Yeah. Or a mistake. Or a mistake. I'm going to call it a lie. Okay. okay. But, but now you realize it's yes. that it wasn't there. You have to understand. Perception. I know, but I tell you, I will take showers with him, and I told Andy, I will take showers when we have relationship in the morning before the alarm goes on, and we will take showers together because obviously, yeah, okay, we get it. It. You're helping it. But the truth is, what? What is the truth? Was he there that morning or not? Oh, I didn't see him in the bedroom or in the shower. Did, did you see him in the house at all? I did not see him in the morning in the house. That was when, when was the first time? So I'm just going to pause it right there. Um, you had detected, and I'm pausing it at 1.12.38 p.m. You and Detective Clavy appear to be engaging her about your previous conversations. Is that correct? That's correct. Could uh, you just indicate for the jury what the defendant told you on June 2nd about Fotis Tulis' whereabouts in, on the morning of May 24th? So during that first interview, she indicated she saw Fotis Tulis. Well, she had shower. Fotis Tulis was there when she woke up. He entered the shower with her when she was taking a shower, and then she later saw Fotis Tulis in the four group office of when she returned from bringing her child to school. And directing your attention now to the June 6th interview, what did the defendant initially say about whether or not Mr. Tulos was home in the morning? She initially said he was home. So, 
17, 13 p.m. The defendant just indicated that she saw Mr. Jules' cellular phone in the floor group office, correct? That's, that's correct. I want to direct you back to the June 6, 2019 interview. Did the subject of Mr. Jules' cellular phone come up? It did. And what did the defendant say about whether or not she had seen his cell phone in that June 6 interview? 
She indicated she had not seen it. She assumed it was with FOTUS. Said that to you. He said, Are you like there's a phone ringing 
where we're going to make some with the phone. Or the call, not the phone, the call. And I picked up the phone. I, I know Andreas, but I wasn't sure that it was Andreas. And I hear like noise, but I did hear Ella. Ella is hello in English, in Greek. Um, and I said hola, and that was about it. Like the communication didn't go through. Okay. Did the phone just disconnect? It looked. Just going to pause it at 122.41. At any point during your first two interviews of the defendant on June 2nd, 2019, and June 6th, 2019, did she mention that she answered Mr. Gulos' phone? No. This is the first time she's mentioning it? Yes. I took a 
picture with the robot in the video and I sent it to be over to my family. I was kind of making a stupid joke about the robot. I bought, or I had to buy, um, and I left and I went back to the house. Okay. Um, what time do you think you go back to the house? Huh? Do you have any idea what time you go back to the house? Um, 10 30 somewhere? It could be. I'm not 100%, but it could be. Okay. I know I called Pedro at some yep. point because I was going to meet with her right. when she was leaving to London that day. Right. Um, she was supposed to give me a check of some rocks that she bought, and I, was, I wanted to say goodbye. So I went, we arranged, and she said something like, I'll be here at 11 because yeah, I can only be fresh, but I'm going to be from the um, a, you say, a short period of time. Right. Okay. So I probably got there at 11. Oh, no. Oh, I think. Okay. okay. Um, probably stay there like 15 minutes, 20 at the most. I sent an email to me with with the descriptions of the items, of the rugs that and she wanted. She told me I'm going to pay you in cash. I said, no, I'd rather have it because she left her, uh, her checkbook. So she said, I can go to the ATM. I said, no, I'm going to pay me later. I'd rather have a check. Berenice was there, and Berenice is her partner, so I obviously saw there was a Berenice power or cloud. No, no, yes, it was, it was Berenice. And when I left, and I was stopped in the pond mm -hmm. to see if the queen was there, ah, because Hodge said, ah, Watch the night before said Queen is already here. If you need someone to pull you, mm -hmm. you can contact him. He's going to be every morning in the pond. Right. So I went to the pond. There was no one there. Uh, it was, the water was windy. There was a lot of wind current in the water. So obviously it wasn't a good day for water ski and then left. Okay. And I went back to the house. Okay. And I was in the house. Yeah, you did. You actually did stay there till 1 32. Okay. PM. Yeah. Okay. And for this comes, we eat. How, how, how long after you arrived back in the house and shot the folks around? Do you have any idea? Yeah. So if I arrived to the house, let's say at 11. You were right back at the house at 11 15. Okay, so probably right after. Okay. So, well, at 1. It has to be he arrived at some point. He did arrive at some point, yes. Okay. It wasn't any, it was at 12. So 12 31. Well, don't guess. Okay, I know okay. he arrived at some point. I don't okay. know how no, fast. Okay. Did he just show up or did yes. he pick, pick him up? No, he showed up in the house. So he showed up on his own? Yes. How was he, what did he look like? How was he dressed when he showed up? Because this is him calling you down, right? Coming down there and watching yes. um, He was with a, I believe he was with a shirt. Like, like a pullover shirt or a button down shirt? No, no, shirt and tie. No, no, not tie. Okay, so you have a button down shirt. Yes. Okay. He uses. Rolls the sleeve. Does his shirt have a collar? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was like right, that. So it had a collar, but there was no tie, and he has the sleeve to roll up. You tell I have never seen him that much with ties on him, but he goes to court. Did, did you know, did you see Focus arrive? No, it was So do you know how long he was at Fort Jefferson before he called up to you? <coughs> I was in, I mean, I'm, I'm, when he called me, I was in the coast room. So, so his appearance was normal? 
He wasn't slain. He wasn't bred. Did he was a good guy? No. He told me. He was a good guy. So you guys told me that the last interview that he was. He had what? Yeah. What asked you? Oh, you asked me. I said no. I didn't okay. see him. Okay. Well, we asked questions. I didn't see him. Okay. It's like the detail you gave earlier with the text message and you gave the middle finger and the blocking. Like that detail. That's the detail we want. But sometimes we, we ask questions to see if there's. But that was the thing. I know. I understand. I'm just giving you an example. All right. Well, the detail we would like to see. Sometimes we ask questions. So you're you're not sure when he arrived at the house when you did. Um, he was dressed in black. 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 He dressed pretty much the same. Okay. Uh, that's why we call. All right. So he calls you. He says, "Let's have lunch." Yes. And what happens from there? Uh, we have lunch fast. Fast. Yeah, because normally lunch we don't sit for an hour. It's like okay. preheated food. Sometimes we do salads, something fast, something easy. Okay. Do you remember what it was? It was that I we ate pastel de papa. What is that? Um, it's meat with uh, mashed potatoes on top. I do that a lot. It's one of the most favorite to. That's the chef. Right. So that's the chef. Yeah. That was the word. Yeah. Yeah. And that was. Yeah. And then. Usually in the afternoon, lunch normally. Unless it's a salad, it's a lunch. Okay, so you guys eat fast. Was was there a rush? No. You, you eat maybe fifteen minutes. Okay. So what happened at lunch? After lunch, um, at some point he calls me. Okay. I, I wake up. Yeah. And, and I don't want to. When you say at some point, it's like oh, you're sitting over. Oh, I receive a call. I receive a call. Fifty-three. Right, so what? What did you do right after lunch? Did you I clean the dishes. Oh, I put them in the sink. You make sure you clean the dishes. Oh yeah. Okay. So you clean the dishes. No, no, I don't like. I clean the dishes. Oh, you put them in the sink. In the sink. Okay. And then what did he do? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But I do this. I did because I have the logs. He called me at some point at one fifty. Something I don't remember. It's okay. But you guys have money. Please try it. Go ahead. Um, he said to go that um, I don't know if it was that call because he called me again after. He said at some point in one of the calls he said, hey, "I need you to bring cleaning stuff to a mountain because a uh, Rania is coming tomorrow." With some clients, and I want the house to be decent. I want to kind of stop you. Just want to make sure you. Perhaps we could pause it right now. This is where, sir. Yes, Judge. Pause it at one thirty-five oh four. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We will take our lunch and recess until two o'clock. Please do not discuss the case. Yeah. Yeah. Just leave it. I'm just going to turn off the screen. Pause.
This Honorable Superior Court is now open and in session. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Judge, before the um, jury comes back in, I just wanted to alert the court that there was a motion in limine filed in uh, the beginning of January regarding whether or not uh, law enforcement were allowed to offer their opinions or their um, analysis of the evidence. And I would just ask the court, I, 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 my recollection is that the court wanted to wait until this was happening. I believe it's happening in spades right now. So I'm going to ask the court to grant my motion to eliminate and to not allow editorializing by the witness. The jury has seen all the documents they saw, but it's been beyond simply what do we see here. The witness has been allowed to describe his opinion on what it shows, including narratives going back. And the motion, I had it up on my screen before... <clears throat> for the break. Terry Schoenhorn should probably wait. The Spanish interpreter is not set up. Oh. Yes, it was a motion dated January 10th to preclude testimony that contains or references speculative statements, theories, or opinions of law enforcement filed January 10th. Um, it's only a one and a half page motion, and we argued it then. Um, you asked me to bring it up when that was happening. It happened only a few times during the course of the trial, and sometimes the court has agreed with me, other times it hasn't, but I think now we're going so far afield when the purpose of this testimony is to show the video, to show the, the final interrogation of my client, but allowing the witness to basically summarize his theories of what was happening before becomes a exactly the kind of, of evidence that I cite in, in the rules, you know, 4-2, 3, 4-4, 7, 1, and 7, 3. And I did cite the case of State versus Beavers at 290, Connecticut 386, which in general just talks about uh, lay witnesses, including police officers, not giving opinions on their on the evidence. That's my claim. Well, the unusual nature of this trial is that there is about or about six or seven hours of police interviews. And the interviews are not edited. And what the jury hears is skepticism from the officers about the defendant's recollection of events or <clears throat> inconsistent statements. The entirety of the video office offer is in this court's view, showing the jury that the officers have opinions about what the defendant said. There can be no controversy about that. They have opinions about what the defendant said on various dates. So to indicate to the court there should be a motion in limine granted, not allowing the uh, officer on the stand to discuss his opinions about the defendant's credibility is belied by the exhibit itself. If you're on a police, the difference, of course, is in the interview, and as I, I think I've already established in this witness in the past has agreed, some of this is uh, interrogation tactics, that it's allowed 
and what they say can be taken, doesn't, doesn't have to be taken at face value. But when the witness is now in the room telling the jury what his conclusion, based on hearsay that he uncovered all this other evidence and they've gathered it, and then to basically uh, offer his opinion on the credibility as opposed to what's said in the videos, which the court is correct. We could have had a debate about whether certain portions of the of the way that Ms. Traconis was interrogated, um, um, where certain things were <coughs> falsehood, certain things were maybe incorrect or inaccurate. But, but we made a decision that the whole thing should just come in so that because they're in our view, the jury would need to see the totality. If we were editing, even if the court agreed to edit things out, it would not paint a full picture of how these interviews were conducted. My concern has to do with the, the questions by, by Attorney McGinnis in this courtroom based on things that were gathered over the next few months. Um, and I did object. The court overruled it. But I wanted to take this opportunity um, outside the present jury, just to expand a little on my concerns and note, I did indicate that I was uh, anticipating something like this in my motion, which I filed. In well, the court is going to take a a global view of the seven hours of interview, and the global view can be captured in just a few words. Essentially, Detective Kimball, you had three interviews because you didn't believe the first two. That's it. The jury can easily draw that conclusion because this offer started with Detective Kimball indicating that most people don't get this chance. We're giving you another chance inferentially because we don't believe you and you're not coming clean that's how this offer is presented so the court denies the motion in limine and i'll just note i i agreed with what the court fully agree with what the court just said my concern is more about him in court telling this jury what he believes and didn't believe that's the part i think is where I think it violates the code. And, and the well, if Detective Kimball uh, said something other than or inferred something other than what's in the video, the court could understand the concern. But essentially, that is not what the court hears. In other words, he is testifying about the reason, first, that there are three interviews, or more than one interview, and secondly, is simply just reiterating What's in the video? The motion is denied. You can bring the jury out. Counsel stipulates, please. Yes, yes Judge. <clears throat> Good, thank you. Detective Kimball, where we had uh, left off prior to the luncheon, you were discussing with the defendant going to 80 Mountain Spring Road. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And uh, what did the defendant say about going to 80 Mountain Spring Road and how that came about? She st told us that she had been called by Fotis Dulos to respond to 80 Mountain Spring to bring cleaning supplies to clean the house. 
for a showing that Saturday. Now, uh, turning your attention back to the uh, surveillance footage, which we watched earlier, um, what did that surveillance footage uh, reveal about when the Jeep Cherokee and Suburban arrived at 80 Mountain Spring Road? So the surveillance video from 77 Mountain Spring showed that first the Jeep, then the Suburban arrived for the first time at 80 Mountain Spring at 136, which would be prior to the 153 call. Okay, and Judge, we, uh, the closest we could get it was to 134.42, so we're just going to pick it up from there.
prior to the 24th or the 20th of November, he had started waking up earlier in the morning. And there was a guy, I don't know if I told you, that he wanted for this to sell his piece of land in New Hartford. Nick. Nick. Told him about it. I told you. Okay, he was contacted for 30 in the morning. He yeah. did several calls, and that was annoying. Sure. Uh, but yes, he was waking up four or five, and for me that was a bother because I don't wake up at that time. You also were in that room that morning, right? No, I know, but I'm saying that in other days, right? Other days. It, right. it bothered me, and I would either move to my Nicole's room, or he would go uh, to another place. Okay. That's. So saying. do you even know what time you woke up on May 24th? Mm -hmm. okay, because you weren't in there with him, right? Mm -hmm. So you have lunch and you know that he's going to Eighty Mountain Spring after lunch? How do you know that? Do because you? he told me. Okay. And he told me. what's he going to Eighty Mountain Spring to do? He told me that it was because Vanya, the realtor, right. was going the next day with some kind and the house has to be clean. Right. And did he tell you that at lunchtime? No. He told me that I was going to that he was going to A and then at some point he calls me saying uh, bring clean supplies mm -hmm. uh, or to clean the house. Okay. For Rania. Okay. That's more or less what I remember. And he called me like at one fifty something. Yeah. And he calls me like at three. Uh, well, let me just tell you that at one thirty-three, Phyllis is driving to Jefferson or uh, driving to Mount Spring, and by one thirty-six, you guys are both arriving at Mount Spring. Okay, so I went with the cleaning stuff. Okay, but you went with him. You guys are both driving into the driveway. Together, together, like literally, right one, right behind you. Are we going together? Do you, you remember, do you remember? Do you remember driving over to Mount Spring? I remember driving. And what kind? Of, which car were you driving? I was driving the Cherokee. Okay. But can you repeat that? Can well, I don't, I don't want to tell you. I'm trying to ask you. No, I'm trying to ask you. When you went over in the Jeep, where was was Thomas already there at Mount Spring? I recall that yes, but the you just repeat what you said that I'm clear on the side. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. So you're you drive the Jeep over at 136 and you arrive. And you're saying Flores was already there, and that's not he's driving in right ahead of you. You're following So then I'm following you. Do you don't remember that? No, I don't I, it could happen. Okay, it did happen. Absolutely it did happen. No, no, I'm just telling I'm you. I'm not saying no. Okay. So no, I'm just telling you that. Strange that you wouldn't remember that. But... No, I don't, John. Okay. I don't. Okay. I, I, no, I, I can't I, tell you what your results are. Okay, and I do remember going back to your house at some point mm -hmm. and then coming back. Like, I did go back from Amy to the house yes, and then from Jefferson to the house yes, because I changed the vacuum for a room. So but when you came over in the Jeep, well, what did you have with you? In the Jeep for cleaning supplies. I brought bucket, a sponge, garbage bags, a, 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 a disposable, um, how do you call the gloves, um, disposable gloves. Yeah, like the um, yeah. yeah. gloves. Yeah. Tight gloves? Yeah. Tight gloves or like the ones that go up your arm? No, no, no. The short ones. Sure. I have package because. I use that a lot. I just put in different when I clean like the cats. Drop in spray. A box with the cats. Uh, the dog. When I clean like when I do it like the meat or the chicken. You wear it. Yeah, that's yeah, you gotta watch out. What color was the bucket? I look at it, it's like it's white, plastic white. Does it have a handle? Is it like a structure bucket or is it like a hockey no, drink? It was a Dubai in the supermarket. Okay. Do you remember what color the sponge was? Uh, I 
Rodríguez. Quiero incluir. And do you remember what color the bags were? Black. Were they heavy bags? Or? Just going to pause it at 143.52. Detective Kimball, in the course of your investigation, did you become aware of certain items that were recovered at Albany Avenue? Yes, I, yes, I did. And uh, would you describe, um, well, for any sponges recovered at Albany Avenue? Yes. What color were they? Again, Your Honor, I'm going to object to this kind of narrative of other police conduct. It's not relevant to what's happening unless there's a... I <clears throat> disagree. Well, the testimony that has already been heard concern sponges, bags, and... Detective Kimball has been asked, did you become aware of the recovery of certain items on Albany Avenue? Response is yes, sponges and bags. So the objection is overruled. The sponge was yellow and green. And what color were the garbage bags? The garbage bags were black.
at some point he was fixing, he had some, um, I think it was pink or blue ribbons along the, the drive of the house. He was very upset always that when Stefan had the open houses, people were stepping in the grass. So he would put the, he put the, like, like, Lines. So people will notice that. Yes. Um, at some point, I know he went to the basement. Um, in the basement of that house, I don't know you guys think it's like, and it's a uh, unfinished. Mm -hmm. It has like construction things. Okay. I've been in that basement maybe two times. Okay. So we went to the basement. Why? No, no, I didn't go that day. He, he went, he said at some point. At some went. point, because I saw that door open. Okay. And obviously, the door was open is because he was down there. Because okay. that door usually is closed and it has a sign that says, uh, I think it says unfinished basement, not open. Or okay. I, I don't know. I mean, I know it used to have a paper. I don't know if it has that paper in the And when I was inside the house, um, and for, for sorry. No, 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 I don't know. All right, well, I wanted to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have to um, The first time you went to the Enon Spring show, um, you were cleaning the kitchen countertops in the bathrooms upstairs. Anything I, else? I mean, I don't remember exactly what I cleaned, but I did, I don't know what I cleaned. I don't know what I cleaned first. Sorry. Okay, but I did tell you the countertops. Yep. And uh, things, the toilet. The toilet. The toilet. Of the bathrooms of the ones on the top. How many bathrooms are there? One, two, three, four. Four bathrooms. Um, Anything else? I cleaned that, that part of the living room. I cleaned the outside. There's a terrace in front of the kitchen. Yeah. I, uh, then I used the room and I picked up like leaves and I got the leaves. So you swept the terrace? Yes, because they, they have they are coming on the single corners. Okay. Um oh, that's I didn't do that much. Okay. So when you arrived this first time, Phonus was driving this bird. When I arrived, uh, when you say that we supposedly we were together. Yes, you were. I was I was in the in the chair of it and right. this was in the super Okay. Were there any other cars there? Yes, yeah, right. the, the red pickup, a red car. Okay, so when you show it. Just gonna pause at one fifty one oh nine. The okay. defendant just indicated that the red pickup of Bell's truck was there. During your June second interview, did the defendant ever indicate to you that Mr. Gumini's truck was at eighty Mountain Spring Road? No, she did not. Did she talk about Mr. Gumini's truck during that first interview? At the very end, end of the interview, she mentioned that Pavel had a red truck, which was dirty, old, and destroyed. But she never said it was at 80 Mountain that she day? She never said that, no. How about on June 6th, 2019, no. did the defendant ever say to you that Pavel's truck was at 80 Mountain Spring Road? She did not know. <clears throat>
Do you have any idea why the truck was there? Do you have any idea why how it got there? Okay. Um, so you went back at one point to to Jeffers. How long do you think you were at Eagle on Springs before you went back to Jeffers? Any idea? Why I think like for maybe an hour, 40 minutes. Okay. 15 minutes. Um, yeah. And now, how long were you at Fort Jefferson when you went back for the vacuum and the brake switch? It could be then like an hour that I was there. And then I know at some point I went back and I stayed longer, but I don't know which time I was longer, if it was the first time or the second time, because I did clean. I mean, part of the house. Mm -hmm. But I don't know which one I was 15 minutes and which one I was more. Okay. But I, I was, was that. Oh, okay. I know. But I, again, that's what I told you. Like, I'm not going to remember. I know I went back at some point and I came back. Okay. That I know. But when you went back to Jefferson, you only, is it true that you only went back to get the vacuum or to switch the vacuum out so it wasn't working? Yes, I don't know. Maybe I stayed there for a little bit longer. Maybe I could have been staying and do some emails. Is there anything going on at 80 Mount Spring that you didn't want to be part of? Not that I know, not of my own knowledge. I, I went back and I had someone, I went back to it. With the room. You did, you did go back to it. Exactly. Was it? If, if, you're just going, if you're just going back, if you're at 80 and you're going back to Fort Jefferson to get to switch out a non-functioning vacuum. And no, then you're going to return to the Mount Spring. You're at Fort Jefferson a lot longer than you would expect yeah. that to be the case. I probably stayed there for a while. Maybe I was in the computer. I could be, I don't know, maybe I stayed and then I went. I, I do remember going back no, with we, the room. You definitely went back. Okay. With the room and I and I swiped. We're not quizzing you on time. Uh, we're, not, we're not quizzing you on time. We're asking you what kinds of things you did, which would account for the kinds that we know are the case. So we're just trying to understand. For instance, another thing is you told us you were washing windows. No, I never said I was washing windows. You said you were cleaning windows. No, I did not. That's not, that's a lie. Oh, I'm not lying. We're not lying. I never said I said I we're talking about the previous year. You said something down right here. Things you say now. Well, no, I think we're not all the same. I, I didn't. Would you like me to think for you? Yes. Well, it's very interesting because there's another thing that we can play for you. Do you realize that? I'm not sure you. Detective, I'm just going to stop it at 154.57. You uh, indicated that the defendant had said in her previous interviews that she was washing windows, and she indicated that she hadn't said that. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Now, um, did she say that in her previous interviews? She, in fact, did not. Was that a mistake? Yes. Okay. Where did that information come from? That information came from Pavel Gomeni, who stated that when he arrived at 80 Mountain Spring Road, Fotis told him that Michelle Traconis had been washing windows. She corrected you. She corrected us, yes. Right. So, you play back the video. You have to see it from our point of view. Like I said earlier, we have a lot, a lot, a lot. Then we did, then we finished. You remember in explicit detail a lot of the things I'm going to call silly, pointless things that were maybe important to you. Like the receipt was in my purse on the counter. But now when we're getting into like the grip, you're not remembering the explicit details that you really need to remember to help yourself. Okay. I don't understand. You remember a lot of simple details. I went and took a picture with the robot. I was going to this person's house. I was to that person's house. But now that we're at the place, that's very important. I don't know. I don't know if I was going for 10 minutes or an hour and a half. But leading up to that, you're very, very good. Can I tell you how? Because I went, I asked Bill for for the chats. I asked my family for the chats. I asked my dad. Everybody that I usually talk to, yeah. even Nicole, I asked them for chats, conversations. So you've been going through all that? 
I've been going, and that's how I know, okay, I went to bed at this time, I went, I spoke, I got my AT&T phone logged, so that's how I know at what time I was talking to whoever I was talking or texting, that's why I remember, but it's not because I have a iron man memory. So I'm sorry if I said I was kidding me not. Well, we definitely uh, said you were okay, kidding. I'm That's sorry. why we're asking you okay, why you're not saying that. What I remember, I said I was in the bathroom and I was looking through the window and I saw for this, uh, how to say, fix uh, the ribbons of the, of the street. The first time I've heard of ever. Yes, it is. Okay, I'm sorry. That's what I heard about. So okay, we may. I mean, I, I don't remember. I remember hearing about there being grass in the and so on and so forth. But I don't think that came from you. That the grass had been seeded the soil, so they could throw the grass. The grass was being done. I said, hey, you're not throwing it. I can't do that grass. No, we don't. We're not seeing any different issues. It becomes confusing. So the thing that we all didn't hear when it actually happened, what we now have on tape that we can play for you. Do you remember this setting? So as we hear the question first, right? You should hear the question. Oh, we have to play now. Uh, Mm Detective, uh, what are you playing for the defendant at this point? I'm playing a segment of the second interview that took place at Attorney Bowman's office on the 6th. And how are you playing it? Playing it on a laptop computer. Either in the kitchen or upstairs. 
he probably went and picked up the uh, paper towel, clean whatever he wanted, wanted to clean. And at, when, at some point, I'm coming out, and he gave me the paper towel. And I threw it in that in that garbage. Yes. 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 going to pause it at 201.52. Detective, um, during the June 2nd, 2019 interview, did the defendant ever tell you that Mr. Dulos had given her a paper towel that was brown in color while she was at 80 Mountain Spring Road? No, she did not. How about during that June 6, 2019 interview? Did she ever include that detail during that interview? She did not, know. No, I didn't see anything. So he hands you a paper towel and he says he just spilled the well, coffee stains in one of the cars that you don't know which car. Was no, it in the Toyota? I, I believe it was in the, in the Tacoma. Okay, so he spilled the coffee, he spilled coffee in the Tacoma? He always carries coffee and he makes me buy the coffee. Uh, Things, basically, whatever they're called in the supermarket. Where was he standing? Where was Otis standing? Outside when he hands you, he hands you his paper towel. I was come, I was getting out of the garage mm -hmm. to go towards outside, and he was coming. So we met there. Where was he coming from? What direction was he coming? From the garage, from the outside of the house. From Did you walk out of the garage? Did you walk out the garage? I, I, I came out from the, it's the terrace, the kitchen, and the garage, and there's a door. Have you been in the house or not? No. I have. We have other people there. I've seen photos of it, I know generally. Um, yeah. And being out in the garage towards outside the house where the parking, where the cars were. Right, 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 right in the garage. The cars were actually out here. Yeah. That's when we. Bomb, not bomb, but I mean, he says here, and I threw it in the, in the garbage that was in the kitchen. So where is he? And the Tacoma was standing here. The Tacoma was The Tacoma was here, I believe. The Cherokee was here, and the Suburban. And, and where this is the house. I'm here. Where is he? Uh, 
eh, Yes. Eh, photos like behind me. Like physical contact. Eh, Pavel arrives. I think photos or Pavel says I didn't see anything or we didn't want to do anything. I think something like a joke. I think 
I did because I wanted to do the rocks, but it was late. And I wasn't going to make it. So I did it. Yeah. I'm getting confused now. You get a call from Otis, and he says you took the keys to Tacoma, bring them back. Is that correct? But I didn't bring them back. I was in the house. I, I, said, the house? I said, I said, I come to the house, or I'm, I'm here in the house. So they, they so had the keys back to the email spring. No. No? No. No. Are you sure? I'm sure. I mean, I gave him the key in the in the house. Okay. At uh, the church. Church. Yes. I did I did not go uh, back to a And so the transfer of the keys to the place of the and we had to Fotis. Fotis? Yes. Where was Fabio? Doing something with the motor. Fabio was there too? Yes. Was there any conversation prior to your meeting in Eighty Mountain between Fotis and Fabio about Tacoma staying at Eighty Mountain Road? Not that I know. Not that you heard? Not that, heard. Not that you're aware of? No. Fotis didn't want him to take the Raptor for the weekend. That didn't come up. There was no discussion that you wouldn't no, stop. That. Not in front of me. Not in front of and me. for what I understood, Pavel took the Tacoma, and that actually I told him, what, uh, how did he take the moto? How he puts the moto on top of the pickup? He says that he goes to 585 in Clip, and that he backs up in a place that there's a hill, and he puts the motorcycle on that. But, they explained me. Jim, uh, did Fotis ever uh, tell you that Papa um, wanted to sell them to come? Yes, yes. When did that take place? Uh, no, I think he told me that. I think it was the last thing in the car wash. Okay. Yes, at some point he tells me, I think Papa uh, wants to sell his car. Um, and he asked me to stay with the Cherokee, and I said, well, I don't care. I mean, we think that if I want the Cherokee for the weekends to go somewhere far, I mean, we get a long trip. He said, oh, no, that's not going to be a problem. But that was, that conversation was, I believe it was on Wednesday when, when I went to take him to the car wash. Do you remember the date of that Wednesday? Uh, 29th. So it's the 29th on Wednesday, you took voted. Just going to pause it at 2.13.21 p.m. Detective Kimball, during your June 2nd, 2019 interview, did the defendant ever say to you that she had gone to a car wash uh, either with or at close in time to Mr. Dulos with the Tacoma? No, she did not. How about in that June 6, 2019 interview? No. Did the topic of a car wash ever come up during that first interview on June 2nd? She mentioned the word car wash, but it was out of context. It was, she did not elaborate in any way on, on the car wash. Thank you. at some point calls me and says, Pick me up at the car wash in the, in the parking lot. And so I went to pick him up, and then we went uh, to meet with Andy. So we drove in. Okay. A little more detail. Okay. Because we're, we're really kind of jumping ahead okay. and chasing. Um, because there was Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, or all days. That yeah. I, I believe. Uh, but I took the Tacoma because actually that night we were in the Raptor. And the next day, Fotis uh, took the Suburban supposedly to see the kids, and I had the uh, Cherokee. And the, second, the Sunday, the same. He had the Suburban because he was going to supposedly pick up the kids in New York. And I had the, um, the Cherokee. So I believe Pavel did take the Tacoma. That's Friday. Yeah. Oh, okay. With the motorcycle. Yeah. So the day of the car wash, you're home, and you get a phone call from Flores to come meet you. 
Yes, he said to me, he said, come and pick me up at um, a, a, I drop off the call in school, I go back to the house, I get to change. A, and he said, he either told me I have to drop the car in the car wash and pick me up in the parking lot, which I did. I picked him up. We came here and then wait, he asked wait, me just to, okay. well, exactly what you did. I went to pick him up. He came, I changed seats, and he drove the Yukon. Yeah. We had the Yukon. The the rental. Now, your understanding, your understanding of him taking it to go and get washed was for what reason? He told me that Abele wanted to sell the car and that, I mean, the, the whole, what I understood was that the whole philosophy was that Abele was going to stay with the Cherokee for a while until he gets a different car. And I said, I don't mind. I can, I, I don't want him staying with the Cherokee as long as that, if I go on a weekend somewhere, I can have the Cherokee because it's easier to drive. And what day was that explained to you that Pavel was going to have the Cherokee? Wednesday. Wednesday? When he went to the car wash. So the day of the car wash. The car wash. Okay. So, alright, so he calls you, says, here, pick me up. Sorry. Yeah, we were talking about, yeah, on the phone at some point he called me like at 9 11 and I called or vice versa. I called him at 9 11, he calls me at 9 13. But we end up in the, in, on 44, there's a car wash. In that car wash, in the parking lot, I pick him up. Obviously, I changed seats, he drove to come down here. Yeah, that's the first day you for the turn point. Yes. And I don't know what time we arrived here, but okay. so and then on the way back, um, I received a phone call from the car wash at one thirty nine saying that the car was ready. I didn't give them my phone number because I didn't go and talk to them. It was full this. Yeah. Okay. And then as driving back, I'm not a hundred percent. We uh, either after the meeting with Andy, we drove back to Farmington. A uh, stop stops in the bank. Uh, then I'm not sure if I picked up Nicole or picked up Nicole in the school. I don't know. Um, this part of my on my flight, and then back to the car wash that I drove him up to pick up the car, and then I drove back home or. I went to pick up Nicole. That's what I mean. The car, he was the car. I mean. So, where were you? When, when did Photos leave that way? When did Photos leave? He was straight drove out of Jefferson with the Tacoma, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you know when he left the house no. that morning? No, but I think it, I think it was like around night. I mean, I mean, I don't and know what I'm about. Where were you when you left? Did you still at the house? I was in the house, but I probably went up right after him to pick up him. When you say you probably went right after him, Michelle. I know. You I, mean, I think I went after him to pick well, up him. after him could be yeah. a minute after him, a second after him, or an hour after him. No, no, it wasn't an hour. Okay. It was so, close to, to going. Uh, after him, like immediately. Immediately after him? Yes. So were you following him out of the driveway? Or did you leave a few minutes after he left? I think, I think it was immediately, like right after him. Okay, so were you following him out of the driveway, or was it a few minutes after he left that you no, left? No, it can be part of it. Okay. Part of it. All right. And when he dropped the car off at Russell's Peter, where were you? In the parking lot, in the car. You were in the parking lot, right? Yeah. Okay. So he dropped the car off. So how do you need to have a phone call from him to come pick him up? Because yeah. you're with him, dropping off the car. No, I wasn't with him. He was in another car, and I was in another in another You were at, in the parking okay, lot. We spoke, and probably we spoke about, okay, I'm going to drop off the car, go and drive to Andy. We had
had, we had two goals. What did we talk? I don't know, but obviously I did drop him off. I'm not saying I didn't drop him off. Not yeah. drop him. I mean, I was in the car. He had to call you to come pick him up. So you actually, you were in the parking lot of Russell's Peters when he's dropping off the call, yes. making arrangements to have a detail, correct? I, I, I didn't say any of that. I was no, in the parking sure lot. Okay, I was in the parking lot. I never went, I never talked to them, but they took the car. I'm not in there. Okay. So but when he's going, when he goes in the rest of the yes. to drop off the Tacoma yes. to get a detail, yes. you were in the parking lot of Russell's uh, Peters. Russell's Peters. That's, is that correct? Yes, I was in the parking lot. Okay, so lot. once he leaves, he, he drops off. He comes out of Russell's Peters. He, he goes to where are you? Shutting down. Okay. He comes out of the office, he's paid for the detail. Does he get into your car? He gets into the car, yes. Okay. So that I understand why he needs to call you and tell you to come pick him up. No, he's he's not pick him up. Maybe it's where are you? He's standing in the parking lot. Are they looking for me in the parking lot? So all I know is you tell us. I know. He's come and pick me up, so that's why I'm asking. Where are you? Is this a good time to take a break, Judge? Uh, ten more minutes. Yes, sir. Where are you to come to the car? Okay. Uh, so you followed him to Russell Speaker. He went and <laughs> left your phone number, apparently. Yes. Right? Me. And then he comes out, he gets into your... Did you, well, you guys switch. You're in the rental, you come in, and two of you drive down together. Yes. to turn your phone in yes. Westport. Correct. Yes. And then sometime during the afternoon through 13 through 139, you get a call yes. and you go back to Russell's Peter. I'm not sure if we went to drive. Oh, first, I don't know if we were driving from here to right. Farmington. Right. I'm listening. Uh, at some point, I know he stops in the van. Well, right. Um, and maybe I drop him there. Or um, so you guys in the back, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm... Kimber, what are you showing the defendant? I have paused it at two twenty two seventeen. Those are two still frames from the People's Bank uh, surveillance from the ATM machine, which is essentially directly across from Russell Speeders. I mean, say People's Bank. It's now M and T Bank. It's out now M and T Bank. Correct. So I'm just saying, yes, you go to the bank and then you go. Do I go? Do I go to pick up the or? Do you remember? I'm just you Well, I don't know, but I know if I went to go up to the car wash and I dropped him off. I want to go back to the email for just one second. Lotus hands you the paper towel. The brown substance. Where did you place that? In uh, in one of the black bags. One of the black bags. Yes. Is that the only thing you placed in the black bag? A uh, oh, I put some paper towels that I used, and then that was it. I left all the cleaning supplies in the kitchen. Okay. So that's the only thing you saw or Terrell that he gave you at eighty nine. Anything else you throw out? The stuff that you used? Yes. 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 Did all that stuff go into that one bag? I don't know because I, did, I never went back to that house and I didn't pick up the key. Okay. So that's already, I guess at some point he put this one back to pick up the Tacoma and he probably took everything. Okay. And I never went back to that stage, baby. After a day. On Friday. What do you mean you never went back after you left? Which time? After you, you went home to switch out the, the vacuum cleaner, right? Uh, yes. And then, then you went, went back. back. Yes. But when we all left, I never, since we all left, which I believe it was around five. Okay. I never went back to A. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Did you ever take photos on, on Friday? Did you ever take photos back to 
Jefferson. So you and Flores at some point are both at 80. Uh -huh. You go back to Fort, to Fort Jefferson around 407. And do you remember going taking photos back to Jefferson? Or having photos and you drive back to Jefferson? On the on Friday. Uh, it could be that he came from Crown Trump. So you don't remember how? No, I think I think I took his phone that he was on charge. You took his phone? To charge it, I think. Can it be or no? I know, but I don't know, maybe he gave me a phone because he said yeah, I have no battery. And then when I went and charged it at some point, then I left. Then you left. I mean, I went back, you're, you're say, where you I are. went back, okay, from Fort Jefferson, I went back to 80. You just took the phone back? Is this an 80 or is this you did it? I, 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 I think I did. I, I think I took his phone to charge. Because his battery phone did. And he, he remained at 80. Yes. Doing what? Cleaning out the car? No, no. Oh, I, I saw him. I saw him. I told you. Outside, I saw him. At some point, he went down to the basement because the door I saw it open. A. And no, that's it. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't paying attention to what he was doing. I was inside the house. Not when he needed the towel to work. Uh, Not when he needed to do the dirty towel you were outside the house. Well, I was walking outside the house, and that's where we met. And the only time I was out is in the porch, in the terrace outside the house, but uh, looking towards uh, the lot. Kind of the north side, the north. To the north. Sorry. This is the house. And, uh, there's a tree here that I like because this tree, I, I like it because how it looks from one of the rooms. And the porch is here, and the garage is here, and the, all the garage parking is here. And there's this is right. So the yeah. lot is here. Right? And he has these two lots for sale. Right. Or well, one supposedly he be sold. This would be an appropriate time to take the recess. Yes, Judge. Pause it at 227.29. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We will take our afternoon recess. Uh, please do not discuss the case. this afternoon, but I sent a copy to the court last night motion in the name with respect to defense experts. Yes. My concern is that I anticipate the state is going to be resting sometime early next week. And so I would like that motion to be heard sooner than later. I'm not saying it needs to be heard right this second, but um, my concern, Judge, frankly, is that um, these experts could be on the stand as early as next week, and we have basically um, really no information about what they're going to be testifying to in writing, and uh, it's a grave concern for the state. And frankly, um, I think that they should be excluded, but we'll take that up at the appropriate time. I just... Very briefly, I mark for ID the two extensive CVs of the two, uh, of the two experts I mentioned. One is Dr. Elizabeth Loftus, who's probably the most preeminent uh, uh, expert in the country on memory and if things that affect memory. So first of all, the suggestion that he doesn't know anything. I'm going to ask the court. I marked the two items for identification and anticipation of this. They are, um, I just have the letters for the record. So the court will at least in anticipation know they're there. And Judge, just to, I, I, to correct the record. 
Excuse me. I'm well, done. Well, I, I, I and JJ, and record. more importantly, Judge Your Honor, well, frankly, well, Attorney Phelps is misrepresenting me. what the state said. It's time for recess because court is not going to entertain and the monitor is not going to entertain counsel talking at the same time. So we'll come back. Three twenty five. All right.
Session the Honorable Judge Randolph is back. Please be seated. So the court has a copy of the state's motion in limine regarding defense experts dated February 15, 2024. Yeah, just very briefly. Um, so I marked. Mr. Connors can be seated. Um, I had indicated even before I provided the uh, disclosures that the state was correct when they were handed that I was planning on calling um, uh, or believing I may be calling these witnesses that deal with obvious things of just memory in general. The Nooses case was the case that at one point the state tried to remember and they couldn't remember the name of the case. I found it. I've read that case. That case specifically says that the defense does not have to have a report prepared by an expert. And what the court needs to understand is a report prepared by a privately retained expert is very expensive, especially it's not a case where either of those experts evaluated Mr. Conus, went you know, talked to her or in any way have to have to testify or will testify about um, her specific person. They're talking in general about the items that affect matters such as stress, fatigue, uh, shock, the things that have already been established in the case. And the, cons and the second witness, that's Dr. Loftus, the second witness, Dr. Uh, or Professor Marianne, uh, deals with the issues of how people who speak more than one language, how they process information, how interruptions can affect their ability to re uh, repeat or report information accurately, so in general. Now, what's concerning to me is twofold. Number one, last Friday, the court specifically asked the state when they were going to conclude. And they said they were going to, they expected to conclude on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, even if there was a snowstorm uh, and the jury wasn't here this past Tuesday, which there was. Now I'm hearing that they're saying that they're going to conclude, quote, sometime during the week which is a problem because I have witnesses flying in, multiple witnesses flying in Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And that's why the court asked uh, the state those questions. So that's concerning to me as well, together with the fact that um, the whole morning was spent over my objection, the court overruled my objection, rehashing evidence that had already been admitted over the course of the last almost five weeks. Therefore, we missed a couple of hours of being able to complete this witness's testimony and the playing of the uh, third interrogation, which I know we're not even, well, we might just, no, we're not even at the half point yet, according to the transcript anyway. It could even be longer if there's delays. So that is pauses. So what I wanted to say in response, I think that the state's motion is without merit. I believe that uh, whatever... They are arguing that they don't have enough time. What they, what Mr. Uh, McGinnis failed to tell the court is Ms. Felsen offered to actually this weekend give Mr. McGinnis every uh, area that we would be covering with these witnesses. I'm going to be speaking to them on the, on the weekend. And at this point, I only have the general areas that have been set forth. And it's a, I'll note that's 40, I forget how. It's 45-page CV. It lists the, all of the articles, everything that uh, Professor Loftus has, has um, uh, written about, and it's all within the scope of that. And the final point I'll make, Your Honor, is this. The state suggests, and I submit erroneously, 
that they have complied and given me all of the reports of their expert witnesses in a timely fashion. And I will just state the record that is simply untrue. Now, I have not made an issue of it. We've been given the name of a witness the night before. In the case of raw data, yeah, they gave us raw data, such as that Birla report, which Your Honor heard, it's like a thousand pages or more long. And, you know, you, you can't tell from that what's relevant and what's not. You can look at it just like somebody gives me, you know, six months or two years of AT&T records, you know, until they actually do a report. Even uh, Agent Hoyland's report was done January 30. No, February 8th, excuse me, I believe. I, I can't remember. But the point being, I sucked it up. I got it. The, the um, gentleman from, um, the motor, from the lab who did the Burla investigation, I got that report with the maps that morning. Did I complain that we had to postpone the trial so I could uh, contact someone else and go into it? No. So my point here, Your Honor, is I have witnesses that are lined up now, it's gonna to be towards the end of next week, but the state has had ample time and their suggestion that they don't is not well taken under any theory or reading of Minusis. Thank you. Judge, I don't even know where to begin, but I guess I'll start with marking a couple of things for identification, since that's a theme for this hearing. Judge, I'm handing forward what has been marked for identification in states 150 and 151, which are two engagement letters between Attorney Schoenhorn and his, quote, expert witnesses. Just ask the court, perhaps direct you to the last page, which is the date of signature. Thank you. Judge, this is absolute trial by ambuscade. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The defense is playing games. That's all this is. The reality is, is that neither of these experts were on their witness list. They have dropped, you know, and Attorney Schoenhorn somehow suggests that a 45-page CV alleviates any prejudice. That belies common sense, Judge. The fact that the CV is so long and we've been given still no clear direction on what she's going to testify to. He's going to speak with her this weekend, I think is what he said. How can we possibly prepare adequate cross-examination under these circumstances? And the defense, and this happens often, they mistake having a burden of proof with not having a burden of production. They are not the same thing. If they want to call an expert witness, they have to give us adequate notice they let us know that they were calling these two witnesses. One was as late as February 6th. The other one was January 30th. Um, attorney Manning asked Attorney Schoenhorn to please put what she would be testifying to in writing, and he did not. And as evidenced by today, he refuses to do so, okay? And so we are really at um, a real disadvantage here, Judge. And I wanna say this. Um, we don't know whether or not we're gonna to need to file a quarter hearing. I have no idea whether or not this type of testimony has been accepted in Connecticut before, mostly because I don't have an adequate proffer as to each witness. With respect to Dr. Marion, I've never heard of this science until Mr. Schoenhorn brought it to our attention. So we might be looking at some quarter hearings next week if we do go forward. Um, Mr. Schoenhorn repeatedly misquotes the state in his oral arguments. What I said was we would be resting sometime early next week, i.e. Tuesday. So he says we would rest sometime during the week. Um, again, he just misquotes us. But Judge, really the issue here, it's a matter of fundamental fairness. You know, we have done our best to collaborate with the defense. We have done our best to accommodate their many requests. You know, Attorney Schoenhorn brings up the Burla report, and that's interesting because he was given that report years ago and asked Attorney Manning if it could be sort of a Reader's Digest version could be put together. And so we did that for him, and that's the version that he got, the version that he requested, okay? So these are 
misstatements of the record, to say the least, Judge. Um, and they are false equivalencies, okay? Now, with respect to Attorney Felsen offering for me to have an opportunity to speak with Dr. Loftus, that is true. The reason I didn't mention it is because I said we weren't going to be arguing this at that point. I just wanted to bring it to the court's attention to argue it, not because I was somehow trying to withhold information from the court. But what's interesting about that is Attorney Felsen asked me whether or not I had received her email about speaking with Dr. Loftus. And I said, no, I haven't seen that. She said, I emailed you. I said, well, I haven't seen it. And then she approaches me and says, actually, I don't see the sent email to you, but you can speak with Dr. Loftus this weekend if you want. So if you look at the Jackson case, Judge, which we cited in our memorandum, Justice McDonald specifically said in that opinion that offering one party to speak with the opposing party's expert is inadequate. It's inadequate because that expert is not just going to say, here, here are all the weaknesses in my testimony that you can expose on cross-examination. So if we look at the Jackson case, which I think is really the model here in terms of late disclosure. Now, in that case, it was the state and the defendant was complaining about late disclosure. They are way over, way over the line in terms of the disclosure here. And they still refuse to give us anything concrete in writing so that we can prepare cross-examination. This is a farce. And the false equivalencies of what we've been doing and what they've been doing have got to stop. If you look at the engagement letters, Judge, they engaged these two experts in August of 2020 and February of 2021. Why weren't they on the so-called list of names that might come up? Why weren't they on that list if they might have come up? I mean, if you look at the engagement letters, if deemed desirable by the attorneys, the business associate shall offer expert testimony in either court or by deposition. So that's a name that might come up. Yet for some reason, we didn't get it. We didn't get it until January 30th. We didn't get it until February 6th. Judge, they should be precluded from offering this testimony. Otherwise, we need a continuance and they need to have their experts write a report. And this is going to take a really long time because this is unfair. This is fundamentally unfair. Well, what the court May does I respond not, quickly? well, this is not a matter of the response at this point. I the court has to make sure the jury is an ambush. Now, looking back on the history of the pretrial proceedings, the court recalls that Dr. Ruva had a report that was made available. So the court is not unaware that when reports are requested, they're made available by the defense. The state's witnesses have had reports made available. The issue here, in this court's view, is whether the state, in fairness and in the interests of justice, can mount an effective cross-examination based on a 45-page curriculum detail. And the court's view is that they cannot. The state is probably not even based on the representations novitiates at understanding this area of memory or psychology, whatever area it falls into. So they cannot even mount an effective cross-examination.
the failure to have a report, if the expert has written a hundred books, it wouldn't be that difficult to generate a report. It could be cut and paste. In this court view, it's an ambush. Unless the testimony by the expert is so general that it wouldn't constitute an ambush. But then it wouldn't be expert testimony. The court is not going to inquire as to the reason there is no report. The court has heard that they are expensive to prepare. The court understands that. That Expense does not outweigh the state's opportunity to cross examine. Now, that just concerns the expert on memory. The expert on cell site placement may deserve different consideration. Cell site placement is, in this court's view, well, depending on who the expert is, not going to be essentially a substantial component of the defense. There's no need to, at this point in the trial, to pretend what this case is about. This case is about the credibility of the defendant and the physical evidence. Cell site placement is not going to be a significant component of the defense. So the court is not as concerned about no report for the expert who will testify concerning cell site placement. But concerning memory, the court is concerned. Because that is the gravamen of the defense. If this is just a matter of slipped memory and not willful failure to disclose information, that's a substantial slice of the defense. And the state should have an opportunity to cross exam. But with a 45 page curriculum vitae and 100 books, the state is not going to have a reasonable opportunity to do that. The court looks back to the testimony of Dr. Ruba. It appeared in that instance the state had a significant opportunity to cross-examine. There was a report. The state combed that report in its examination, its cross-examination. That opportunity is not here. So concerning the memory expert, court grants the motion. Concerning the cell site placement expert, the motion's denied. And Judge, does that also include Dr. Viorica Marion, who apparently was going to testify about linguistics and memory? Yes. I, I just want to point out, Your Honor, that um, the court did not allow me to uh, put all the stuff on the record that I was going to put on. So I just want the court to be aware of a couple of things. First of all, the fact that I retain people to consult years ago is very clear that until they were necessary to be witnesses. That was when Detective Kimball first testified, even while he was still on the stand. That's when it was first disclosed to the state that I intended to uh, call an expert potentially, but I had not yet had an opportunity to follow up with that. But I gave the CVs that I was given at that point. This goes, what the court is doing, I want to be clear, this is the defense. So the court 
is specifically denying the de defendant to put on a defense. And State v. Manusa specifically says the court does not have the authority under the practice book rule that the state had cite cited in its motions to require the defendant to prepare a report at her expense. So until the decision was made, I've consulted with a lot of experts, including a cell site expert, so I would be able to intelligently, I consulted with a DNA expert, I consulted with a, a CD a tower expert. The question about whether they would be necessary for trial is something that comes up during the course of the state's case and not ahead of time. So to suggest, and I want to note that I was given a note here, one of the things that Attorney Felsen offered to do was give actual transcripts of Dr. Loftus' testimony from other cases, which I know Mr. McGinnis uh, failed to note to the court. So if the court is saying the defendant is not allowed to put on its defense, and that's the main point of its defense. In fact, I would say it's the sole basis of defense other than there is no evidence of her involvement on any of these charges. Then at least I want the court and the record to be clear that that's what the court is doing. I'm also aware that every one of or many of her testimonies are also available on, on public websites. So they could have looked at that. And again, we're talking about January. So they've had all that time. They give me, and the court has permitted it, the night before I'm given the name of a witness for the next morning. I'm given no extra notice. So that what the court has now done is they've countenanced this entire trial with the state by ambus ambuscade or ambushot. The last minute I have to prepare that night for the next day's witnesses. And Your Honor would not even require them to do a full of who they actually were going to call as witnesses. There are 180 names on their list, 150 to 180. I don't have the exact number. And I get, I was told I have to be ready to cross-examine any one of them because if they're on their list, that's their, that's their list. So I want the court to be, to understand that it would be maybe the only case in Connecticut history where the court has precluded the defense because of a, and I submit, an erroneous allegation by the state that they don't have enough time to prepare. We've sat through hours, we've sat through days, days, Your Honor, of testimony of witnesses saying we didn't find anything. And I objected to that. The court allowed all that in, even though it had no relevance to the case. And I submit will confuse the jury. Your Honor pointed out I could cross-examine on the absence of evidence. But when it comes to the right to present a defense, it's paramount. We're not on the same team. The state has a burden, has a statutory burden to turn over everything. And there is nothing that this court ordered. There's nothing that was required to be turned over that would require the defense to prepare a report, quote unquote, by experts. And these are not scientific experts. So even the statement about state versus Porter, perhaps Mr. McGinnis doesn't know and under Connecticut law, Connecticut has not adopted the Kumho uh, tire line of cases. So under Connecticut, the only expert Porter hearings have to do with new scientific uh, research, scientific uh, reports, such as DNA and whatnot, and whether STR mix would be uh, admissible. So I just want the court to, it, to be aware that, and I'm saying this on the record, the court is denying the defendant his her constitutional right under the state and federal constitution to present a defense. Now, the last thing I want to well, ask before is... Before you proceed, is, counsel, this court's practice is not to impugn counsel, but there is the practice of impugning the court. What the court is doing is the result of what the court is doing may be in counsel view to deny the defendant an effective defense. Yeah, I'll ref I apologize. I'll rephrase that the effect of the court's rule is to deny the defendant the right to present a defense. And I just want to clarify, though, is the court also precluding general teaching testimony on the subject as well, even if it does not refer to the specifics of this case? 
Well, the court has no idea what is going to be the testimony. That's the concern. Well, I, I didn't. And here's what the court did not want and would not allow that there'd be a rerun of these seven hours and the videos be stopped. And then the expert is asked, what about this? What about that? 25 minutes in, what about that? 18 minutes after that, what about that? The court wouldn't allow that. So <clears throat> even if the court were to indicate there'd be some testimony allowed, it wouldn't allow that. Understood. And the court's second view is there is a Sixth Amendment right to a speedy and public trial before an impartial jury in the state and district in which the crime shall have been committed, which shall have been previously ascertained by law. The defendant shall have the right to cross-examine, bring in their own witnesses, subpoena witnesses, and have counsel for their defense. That does not mean a defendant can present any kind of defense at any time for however long with whatever continuance is needed in any manner. You may proceed. Judge, may I just be heard briefly? Yes. So firstly, he misreads Manousis entirely. Manousis does grant the court the authority to uh, order the expert to produce in writing their opinions. That's number one. Uh, number two, um, I would just note uh, that Attorney Schoenhorn's argument really is a house of cards and it collapses because what he, indic what he indicated is that once again, a false equivalency that somehow uh, the court is being unfair to the defense because we're, they're only finding out who the witnesses are a day in advance because they're on our witness list. Listen carefully to that. They, I'm they're, sorry, they're I wasn't our, done your they're on our and witnesses. I thought he was going to interject and said he's now doing his rebuttal. I, I'm the not used going, to the that. The court is going to give both counsel their opportunity. So we're not in a rush. The difference, of course, is that our witnesses were actually on our witness list and theirs wasn't. So the argument, quite frankly, collapses on its face. Attorney Schoenhorn. Yes. The defense, I want to be clear, does not have a duty to produce with a list of witnesses. Once a witness, a person is determined to be a witness, depending on the state's case, it is immediately produced, even though that's not the requirement. But what I just heard say was the court has, an, has the authority to order an expert to prepare a report, but the court never did that. So the fact that Manousis in, I think, dictum says that under one of the practice book rules, the court could order that, that didn't happen here. And what Manousis says is that under the, under the practice book, the practice book rule does not require a witness to prepare a report. And I'm indicating that we are in the process of interviewing those witnesses as it pertains to this case. So if the court wishes, and if that's going to be the issue, then between now and Tuesday, we will prepare a discovery response that will cover the areas that the witness is intending to uh, respond to. But to suggest that we should be precluded from putting on testimony about how things like, like sleep deprivation, stress, et cetera, affect people's memory, the fact multiple people questioning at the same time, the implantation of by drillings into somebody memories that then by the next time they become to believe is their own. Again, without specific reference to any per particular person, it's based on her, for example, Dr. Loftus, her 40 years of research and study. So well, the, co the court understands, counsel. The issue for the court is not whether there is what would be referred to as a report. As counsel knows, you can submit or it has been submitted when a brief is asked for, a letter brief. The court hopes counsel has seen those. I have, yes. Or some sort of, in technical areas, some sort of abstract. But when there's nothing, 
that tilts the seesaw of fairness. So your expert, again, in, my, in this court's view, can cut and paste and put something together very quickly. All right. I understand. May, may I be heard, Judge? Yes. I mean, I, I would object to the defense being given that opportunity at this point because we've been asking for it. They haven't done it now because the court has precluded the testimony. They apparently want to dump a report on our laps um, at the last minute in some last ditch effort to try to save this testimony. And it's still a late disclosure. We still don't know how much time we're going to need to digest this report, whether or not it's valid. By the way, Attorney Schoenhorn said it's not scientific. Well, if it's not scientific, then it shouldn't be admissible. That's my view. Because um, as the court indicated, if it's just general testimony, it's not expert testimony. So that's the first thing. But uh, to try to have them resurrect this proffer after just arguing with the court for 15 minutes about how they didn't have to produce a report, I'd ask the court to not revisit its ruling because we're still going to be in the place we are, which is we're going to get a report dumped on our lap on Monday night and we're going to be expected to cross next week. And it's unfair. Well, here's what the court is inclined to do. Of course, the report is going to be admitted as a full exhibit, correct? If there is a report, that's what generally would have to happen. The court would require, and this is uh, irregular, the court would require what the court will term a report but in whatever form it comes by tonight at midnight. Email the court with the report. So the court knows that it has come in, made available to the state. Council had indicated- say, Your Honor, I don't even know if we could reach these individuals by tonight. So that's part of the uh, concern. Uh, Dr. Loftus is in California <coughs> and Professor Marion is in Chicago. And there it is. That's what I'm talking about. They want to dump it on us. Well, the court's ruling is tonight at midnight. They have assistance, I, the court would suspect, graduate students, fellows, and the court wants to know what has come in by tonight at midnight. And the state has had an opportunity to receive it. Um, we need five minute recess so we can make a phone call right now. That's fine. Uh, let's come back in at five minutes after four.
Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Please be seated. Thank you. Your Honor, may I have one moment to run outside? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Marshall, when the jury comes in, the audience need not stand up. Bring the jury in, please. Council stipulate. Yes, Judge. Yes. yes Judge, we're going to uh, pick it back up at 227 Right? 
Pause at 232.08. Detective, uh, in that uh, last segment, you suggested to Attorney Bowman to take a break or ask if they needed a break. Is that correct? That's correct. And why did you do that? We wanted to have uh, a little bit of regrouping. We give him a chance to speak to his, turn, his client and hopefully talk some sense into her. All right. Um, at this point, Judge, if, if I, with the court's permission, can I jump ahead 30 seconds at yes. a time until everyone returns? Yes. Pause at 240 26. Attorney Bowman is speaking with uh, another gentleman. Who's the other gentleman? 
That's Detective Chris Allegro. Just, 
There's so much to this. There's no way you just didn't know. You're, you're too involved. You're, you're, too, you're there. How, how many of you hit this? So, so you really need to tell us what you truly, truly, truly know. And you've been given the gift. All right? You've been given a gift to, to give yourself lots of freedoms in the future that you may not have. Jennifer Lenton, her boyfriend, kills his two parents. They go missing. The girlfriend, she doesn't know anything. She gets arrested for one of the two charges you're charged with. She goes to jail for a lot less than what we have on you. She's doing eight years. Eight. And that's what you're looking at, but you have multiple counts. You have to explain this to you. Help yourself and tell us what you know, because we all believe you know a lot more. And if we're going to continue to go through the timeline, we're all set. Shall I? For Wednesday, when he goes, he's with Jennifer. You send him the middle finger emoji, because he doesn't respond. Just you're pissed off at him on Wednesday, right? You're mad at him? I you are. Why else would you give him that? That's, that's a F you, right? Yeah. So you're mad at him. Then on Friday, you wake up, he's not there. You don't know where he is. You told me you didn't know where he was, right? How do you not ask him where he was when he comes home for lunch? How does that happen? Oops. Do you know more, yes or no? And if you do, give us that answer and then start telling us. If not, I think we're all set. Okay. Yeah, that's From right. the beginning, when you started to think about us. Okay. No, that I don't know. Do I you know, know more, yes or no? No, I don't know about anything that he did like or anything. I'm do just you know more about this, yes or no? I don't know yeah, about what? About Jennifer going missing and all the details that surround her. Do you know more than what no, you told us? No, I'm just telling you. What he was like when I went when I came out of the of the what's the called name of the eighty mountain and he asked for the paper towel. Yes, he was cleaning the tacoma. He was cleaning the tacoma. All right. So you've given us a lot of detail, but it's not the detail we need to hear. Okay. If Focus was cleaning the tacoma, you saw he said more. Still you, saw, I, you need to give okay. us I'll, that detail. I'll give you every detail. Explicit that, detail. That Wednesday, I tell you, please. I didn't know where, I thought he was in Grace Farm. I found out that he wasn't in Grace Farm when he spoke with Jacob a, probably Monday at night, and Jacob said, for this, were you inside that house that night? Were you, when you were having dinner? And I didn't know, I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said, e, because if there's a hair, a piece of skin, Whatever of you inside that house, you're in big trouble. In that house, is Jennifer's house. Jennifer's house. Wells. Uh, Wells Lane. Yeah, we're Jennifer. No, yeah. And his response was? No, no, I did not go in. No, I did not go in. Yes. Okay. But you didn't know he was at that house. I didn't know. Okay. I didn't know. So uh, that's when I got really pissed off and sure. I said, You lied to me. Sure. You didn't go you, you told me that you were in Grace Park and that that's why there was no signal. This is the mission that we want to talk about. Of course I was upset that day, you know, that was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that was on a Monday that he spoke with Jacob that night, mm -hmm. okay, then prior of that day, I knew, because Focus was lying to me, he told me that the, the day before Mother's Day, that I was in Boston with Nicole, and he came later that night. I said, how was your day? Oh, we had a fantastic time. We went to the fair. Wait. That was a... When was Mother's Day? Maybe 12. So 11. He went to the fair with the kids and the supervisor. Okay. And he said, oh, we had a nice time. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, perfect. I, I, I got you a gift. It was chosen. Okay, good. That night, I said, and then he said, Constantly went to a lacrosse match. I'm like, and again, I'm like, why she does that? Why she takes the kids when it's your day to have them all? And she he goes, well, you know how she is. And I and she said, no, but she just picked him up and, and, and took him to the whatever game. Okay. The next day, we were with all the family of Mark having uh, celebrating Mother's Day, and I hear Potis telling Mark that Jennifer spent a couple of hours in that fair with him and I didn't know either so again I got upset
says, I went to the car because I couldn't do a scene there. I called my mom and then my sisters. Then I went back to the um, to the place where we were having the Yeah, and I think it was a York, I don't know. To the restaurant where we were. And then that night, I'm like, why are you lying to me? And he said, well, I don't want you to get uh, upset. So yes, it's true. Paul has had these things of chatting with women, looking at other women, and I would get upset, yes. but I didn't know until I found out. Okay, so now let's go back to 80 Mile Road. Okay. Well, I understand that history and things that upset you. We're here about what happened to okay. Jennifer, all right? Okay. So tell us everything you saw. You explain it in the Tacoma. He, so you he, say, why are we just getting that now? Why am I no, doing it? What's here? Okay. All the details. He, he asked for paper towel. He went inside. I think he went from the outside because I was outside. I said, the paper towel is in the kitchen or it's upstairs because I put a bed in the bathroom, in front of the bathroom. He went, grabbed it. And then at some point, when I'm coming outside, he w was walking from the Tacoma, like turning around from the Tacoma and walking towards me. Which side of the Tacoma was he on? Driver's side. Yeah. Driver's side. Driver's side. Who was looking for going out? Which side was he coming from? From the vehicle pilot. The passenger side. The passenger. So it's a pickup truck, so there's only a driver and a passenger. Well, I thought it was four doors on one. Okay, but I thought it was it was from here, and this is the the the, pass, the driver and the passenger. Yeah. So he was coming from here. Yeah. And, and, and then he walked and he grabbed me, he gave me a piece of paper over the toilet, the um, uh, paper towel, and I put it inside where I had the bath of cleaning, the, what I was cleaning, the house. Okay. Did, did you see still coffee? No, I didn't see that. Did you see a coffee cup? No, because I didn't look inside the car. Did the paper towel smell like coffee? No, I didn't smell it. Well, it was still your old night coffee sticks. But I went up, I hold the paper towel, but I didn't smell it, I didn't see that. But even still, you didn't smell coffee? No. How coffee is when you smell it sticks? Uh, yeah. You smell it. Uh, yeah. You yeah. 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 What other detail so, can you give? The other detail. Before Pavel arrived, we were against a Tacoma. Can I put a. Well, he was behind me. Uh, like I, like I push him like that, I turn around, I put my hands in his pocket, and he goes like this and says, I'll give you the surprise tonight, something like that. He made like a joke. And that's when Pavel arrived. Does that happen on the passenger side of the car? Yes. Yes, because the Takuma was looking that way. I'm going to ask you a question, I'm just curious. My own mind. When you're on the passenger side of the car, are you guys pull it around? Yes. Yeah, okay. I'm going to pause it at 253.47. The uh, defendant just indicated that her and Mr. Lewis were fooling around on the passenger side of what vehicle? The Toyota Tacoma. Now, at any point during your June 2nd, 2019 interview, did the defendant give this detail that her and Fotis were being physical with each other? Not at all, no. How about on June 6, 2019? No, not at all. Yes. In the passenger side of the Tacoma with the door open. 
Yes. And that's at 80 mile and on the 24th. On the, on the 24th. Yes. After Fotis has cleaned that car. Yes, because he gave me that paper. I went in and then I came out. Okay. So, please continue. Our it arrives, they, they make like a job now because like three weeks later or a month <clears> before, <throat> um, I found us in the kitchen. And since that day, we were making jokes. I thought we were not doing not anything. Okay. anything. I think Pavel says something about the bicycle. He talks about a bicycle. Okay, tell me about the bicycle. No, he said, oh, you're, you're riding bicycle, you're doing uh, rides with a bicycle. And that's before they were talking about, they were talking, that, that was either before or after talking about 61 surgery. All right. What do you mean? Uh, Abel says this today, uh, the 24th, the bicycle conversation comes up? Yes. So, Paul, I'm, I'm almost just let me sure. But then, then we saw, I saw Paul on Tuesday when the time, with the three of us. <coughs> Did Pavel say that he saw a bicycle in New Canaan on the 24th at 61 Sturbridge? No. no yeah, I'm yeah, trying to understand. So, there was a bicycle at this house. Which bike was it? Not a bike, not a motorcycle, a bicycle. A bicycle? Yes. Okay. Uh, for this old bicycle. What color is it? Dark gray, brown beach. It's dark gray, brown wood. Is that bike at Fort Jefferson? It must be. It must it be. It must be there. Okay. Tell me what Pavel said about the bicycle. Something of riding, uh, are you riding bicycle, or you're training, or are you being Armstrong, something like that. Okay. Do you know why I said that? Because he was making a joke because he saw a bicycle. Okay, so at 80 Mountain that day, there was a bicycle. There was a bicycle. Was the bicycle in the Tacoma? No, it no. was inside the house. It was inside the house? Yeah, inside the house. It's under a rush. It's under a rush. It's under a rush. It's a... just going to pause it at 257.15. The defendant just indicated to you that she saw a bicycle in the garage of what residence? Of 80 Mountain Spring Road. On June 2nd, 2019, did the defendant indicate to you that she had seen Fotis Dulles' bicycle at 80 Mountain Spring Road? No, not at all. How about on June 6th, 2019? Did that detail come out? No, it did not. It's an old bicycle of Fotis that Fotis said that, that he had it since he was like 18. Because I have, I have, when I went to pick up my stuff, I grabbed the three bicycles, the two that are mine, and I have them with them during the hotel. Uh, the mountain one, the street one, those two are mine, and the street of Fotis, that is uh, my grave. But that one, we, I bought it, we bought, we bought these two together like last year. It was that bicycle at 80 Mountain um, ever before? Which one? Excuse me, the bicycle that they're talking about. I don't know because I go to his house only when he shows it to some clients in particular. And no kind of people, no kind of bike. No, my son. Is that a Is there a I know it's supposed to be a good bicycle, but old. Okay. okay. So what else? And that's it. And then at some point we all did. <laughs> Alright, so now let's talk about the keys. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be open with you. Just tell you. Pavel sees the keys hanging in the passenger side door okay. and he arrives at 80 Mountain. Okay. Okay. He and Fotis go for a walk and they talk along the grass and that's coming up nicely to the area where the ribbon is. According to Pavel, that's when you leave and when they come back, the keys are gone. So suggesting that you took the keys. keys. So I'm just going to pause it at uh, 258.49. Detective Clavy was relating what Pavel Gumiani had stated during his interview. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Uh, but that's not exactly what Mr. Gumiani said, correct? That's correct. That was not what Mr. Gumiani had said. What, what information did Mr. Gumiani provide during his interview? Mr. Gumiani indicated that... Objection hearsay. Well, the question is, what did Mr. Gumiani say during his 10 hour interview concerning the bicycle. 
on the objections of hearsay. Well, the panoramic view of what is being shown to the jury is relevant to the questions that are being asked of the defendant. So they're not, in this court view, offered for the truth, but how the police are going to interrogate the defendant concerning the bite overruled. What did Mr. Gumini say regarding the keys? Mr. Gumini said that he was leaving. When he left 80 Mountain Spring Road, he left in the Raptor. As he was leaving, he saw the keys to his vehicle in the door of his vehicle. He thought for a moment to uh, retrieve them at that time. He decided that he was going to be coming right back. He left them. He left. And when he returned with Fotostulos in the Raptor, the keys were missing. There's no reason why I took the, I took the keys and I left. I, I... So this is where the problem is. This is where it's problematic. This is where we come back to this. All the things that we talked about in here that were said by you, not once, sometimes twice, because we met two times before, that, but I said, were, that were less than truthful. Now all of a sudden, you're taking the keys. You have to understand how that looks. Okay? I think it looks very bad. Okay? You need to explain why did you go along with this? Because it looks like you knew what you're saying. Telling us in the kitchen with Babel, 
Stop it now. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, have you, uh, no, you've heard that there isn't going to be a session on Monday. It's a uh, state holiday. We are going to resume with the state's case on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. Have a safe weekend. Please do not discuss the case. Please do not follow media reports about the case.